uh, civilian aide to the Secretary of the Army for this part of Florida. His name is Luis Martinez Monfort. I'm going to let you introduce yourself. Luis? Sure. Um, my name, as Eric said, is Luis Martinez Monfort. I'm the newly appointed civilian aide to Secretary of the Army for this region, the Tampa Bay region. Um, just by way of introduction, I think most of you have probably had some dealings over the course of your career with the CAS, at least I hope so. There's about 100 of us all throughout the U.S. and its territories. And what we do is we bridge the gap between the Army and the civilian community by disseminating information about the Army's objectives and major programs to the public through speeches, personal contact, and participation in Army and community events. Uh, we are charged with a three-pronged mission by the Secretary of the Army. We assist with Army recruiting. We support an active liaison to the Secretary with the National Guard and Army Reserve in our areas. And we support the Army Soldier for Life program. And I will tell you, it's, it's a real pleasure to be connecting with Suncoast Chapter of AUSA and with all of you. And I'm looking forward to, during the course of my two-year appointment, a really fruit, fruitful relationship supporting our veterans here in the Tampa Bay community and doing what we can to improve, every, uh, to improve recruiting and to improve veteran benefits in this area. And I'm extremely excited to hear the different stories about the successful business entrepreneurs we have here, which obviously is a huge concern and a huge focus for the Secretary of the Army in addressing its people first focus that we're transitioning into and assisting veterans as they, as they separate uh, and leave the military and joining the workforce in the community. So I'm looking forward to today's presentation and thank you for having me. And, and I'd like to thank Luis here for hosting us at his office. We're in a beautiful office on the 11th floor. I think we're overlooking the University of Tampa. We are. I can say I can see palm trees and, and the Tampa Bay, but I don't see sun. So don't, <laughs> don't be too jealous. So <laughs> it's a little bit rainy here today. <clears throat> but so before we start, I'd like to give a shout out to some of our some of our folks. We've got the Greater Atlanta Chapter of AUSA. Uh, Scarlett Williams is the president of the chapter there, and we could not have done this event without the help of Dwayne Williams, who's a, a personal friend for many years, and uh, he has done a lot to help a lot of the AUSA chapters over time. He's an exemplary leader. Um, we also have the Coastal Carolina Chapter at Glasso, and and Cindy here is our Vice President of Marketing and Communications for our chapter, but she's also the Vice President in, at the, of the Coastal Carolina chapter. So we, we couldn't have done it without months of work from on Cindy's part and also her team, um, Crank, Crank Marketing Group. Um, so thank you to them and thank you to the Coastal Carolina chapter. Also welcome to this group, the uh, Association of the U.S. Army European Region. Uh, Tony Williams is the president and I see him in the chat. I don't see him. I don't see him uh, in the, in the uh, speaking group, but um, he's on there. He is responsible for the European region, which includes Europe, Africa, and the Middle East. I know we have a lot of people dialing in from from Kuwait, Germany, Italy, Greece, and places overseas. Um, yeah, and last shout out here is going to all the ROTC cadets who are joining us today. We invited them to celebrate our celebration of Black History Month. <clears throat> this kickoff, this is the kickoff event of a new educational program that we started in our chapter together with, uh, it, was, it was Cindy's idea here to push this off. It's the Pivot to Excellence program. And over the next months, you're going to see a lot of outstanding, outstanding educational events coming out of our area. And uh, we're looking forward to cooperating on that. Remember that name, Pivot to Excellence. So starting into our panelists today, for Black History Month, we decided to hold a Black Veteran Entrepreneur Business Summit. And this is, this is what it's about sharing people's history, sharing their stories of success. And so we got a great, a great panel of entrepreneurs here. So I would say that we would start off with the entrepreneur telling her story. Let's see who, who are we going to ask first? Alyssa, Alyssa Clark. Are you dialing in from Atlanta? I think you're on mute right now. We're turning over the microphone to you, Alyssa. Okay, good morning. 
Tell us your story. Well, can I introduce myself? And Absolutely. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so good morning. My name is Alisa Clark, president of Glory Professional Cleaning Services. And I have to take this time to thank my God in heaven, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who sent this son, Jesus, to save me. That's my story. I'm sticking to it. And I can only tell you about what I know about. So <laughs> that's my introduction. And what kind of, what's your, what, what, were you in the army or what, which branch and how did you become an entrepreneur? Army, cool. <laughs> cool. <laughs> All right. Well, basically, uh, I was coming to the end of my military career, and we were at table, kitchen table um, conversation. Of my husband was like, "Have you started uh, thought about what you uh, wanted to do?" And at that point, I know that my time was coming to an end, and I, and we talked and discussed it. His parents had a cleaning service, and um, that's what we decided to do. So uh, me, him, I was still in the Army. Uh, me, him, the kids were with family, um, with cleaning accounts. I would be in the Army in the day, and at night, uh, we would go and clean accounts, and that's how we got started. Great. What were your challenges, and what what's your secret recipe to success? Challenges um, is everything in, into an adventure. It, it was really a great, great thing to have family, uh, um, you know. And initially, we were just mom and pop. I mean, it was us, uh, a couple, and everybody just wanted to, of course, for us, with starting a business, make extra money. So those first couple of years were really great, those first 10 years. So as we move from, I guess you'd say, being mom and pop in essence, um, hiring more people that we didn't know, going into other areas to serve, serve um, to provide services, that's where some of the challenges came. I think one of the greater things was I was personnel, well, a medic, of course, in the Army or in the military. You have several different jobs that you do, but the policy, procedures, SOPs, that type thing is what really were instrumental. Um, you know, um, human resources can make or break you if you don't have. Uh, have that tight that can really hurt you. So um, those are some of the assets that I brought over. My husband was Navy, but I married him, so he moved up. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I guess in about year 15, we went over to Greenville and Anderson, South Carolina after servicing, I'm sorry, the state of Georgia. We're based out of Georgia. And then we went down to um, Florida. We uh, provided services at and Homestead Air Force Base. That's a great state. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> All righty. I, 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 I apologize, Alyssa. What kind of clients do you? I, you said you're at Homestead Air Force Base. Is it government contracts and private contracts and private entities, or who do you well, do business with? Who are, you, who are your clients? I guess I should ask. Well, basically, we're 90% commercial. Um, we had um, three government contracts. In fact, um, recently became an 8A uh, certified business with services mm -hmm. for veteran woman on. I see Sheena in the background. <laughs> and so, but because commercial has been so great to us, my husband had asked for. Years, when you gonna get your AA, when we gotta go, but it's like every time I would pivot, I just kept being called back on the uh commercial side. But um, we've came off a five year contract with the U.S. Embassy in Kingston, Jamaica. Mm -hmm. Uh, last year because of COVID, uh, we got extended, and now so with this AA certification, getting all of the administrative data, it's only been 
short of six months, uh, getting that down, getting that down, we're just looking to broaden over and to the government sector. Now, is, is that something, and, and is that something that, like you said, the commercial accounts were very good to you throughout the development of your business, but is that something you would encourage veterans to do on the front end as they start becoming entrepreneurs to get rated like that and to look into government contracts as well as commercial, or would you encourage them to go straight commercial at the beginning to establish the business? Well, it depends. So for us, one of the things that we did not do, um, I'd say if you're in the military and if you're in logistics or whatever you're doing in the military, and if you're going commercial to sell to the government, that would be great. So we just took that other path to go commercial first. Mm -hmm. um, there's no problem in having a mixture but um, just after being in it, I found out, I mean, I, I guess when it was time to get out, I didn't even think about that at the time. We started uh, cleaning dealerships and I can remember, I don't know how much time we had. I went into the, we went to get a car and I told this uh, uh, dealership owner, I said, this place is filthy and they give us a quote. And that was the first contract that we got. And, uh, you know, so, and here we are. <laughs> so there, there are different paths, but, um, you know, you it's, it's good. It has been great for us to have a, a commercial base for all of these years because I was talking to one of the people that used to be a competitor. So now we're complimenters or strategic aligning for business. And he said, you know, I'm just so proud of you guys because, well, one of the big certifications, 8A, of course, uh, a lot of people come in early, too early, time goes by. And he said, I really admire you guys. I mean, I guess I'm tooting my horn a little bit. <laughs> he said, because 80% uh, of the people that I know that come out the 8A program are out of business. And I was like, okay. So um, we've transitioned from janitorial to facilities uh, and construction management. And so that's the path that we've taken. And um, <laughs> I see you clapping, <laughs> but um, yeah. Thank you. John, John uh, Jackson, Stagvest, can you tell us about your cool business? You've got a lot going over there. Sorry I caught you while you're, <laughs> I know he's on the road. He's calling him from Louisiana. Yes, guys, uh, thanks for having me. Um, again, my name is John Jackson. It is, uh, what is it, Wednesday uh, in Louisiana. So uh, happy Mardi Gras. I'm eating my king cake and uh, yes. sticking with the <laughs> New Orleans tradition. Um, let me see, let me put this back on. There you go, all right. Um, yeah, so uh, my name is John Jackson. I'm an executive director of Stag Vets. I am also the founder of uh, one of our programs under Stag Vets, which is called Comfort Farms. Um, I ended up getting out of the military in 2015, of January. Worry. I served with the uh, 75th Ranger Regiment I did six combat tours, um, my first, uh, and pretty much my first eight years, I spent 40 months overseas in combat zone. So had a lot of time, lost a lot of dudes. Um, it was a great, uh, it was a great experience for myself. I ended up getting medically um, discharged. Um, I denied E7 trying to, um, as I was going through, I just told my SAR majors, you know, at the time that um, I couldn't make it. I was going through, I had a lot of, uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff going on with me. Um, I've done a TED's talk, so if you guys ever want to look at that, you can kind of see agrotherapy, um, John Jackson agrotherapy, and things like that. So I've I got a lot of information out there. But more importantly, one of the biggest things for me was um, <clears throat> when I was in a situation uh, and I needed the VA's help. Um, I remember calling them and uh, they said that, "Hey, man, there's a, a six weeks a six week." you know, uh, six weeks where I was going to be seen. And quite frankly, um, quite frankly, I didn't have six seconds, you know, um, in, in my mind, let alone six weeks to be able to talk to the VA. 
Um, but that taught me something that taught me um, and pushed me towards, hey, if I'm going through this, I know a lot of other of my fellow vets are going through the same thing. And um, I just really started to uh, kind of like internalize um, how to solve this problem from the roots up. And one of the things I was fascinated about doing in my own personal life as I knew I was transitioning was farming. Um, I'm from Jersey City. I'm a city boy. Uh, I like to call myself a professional fat boy. I love to eat. So um, <laughs> and I wanted to, and I wanted to um, have this awesome, sexy barbecue shop. That was it. That's where it all started. The dream started getting out of the military, start this barbecue thing. And I'm, then, I, then I took a step back and said, whoa, in order to be the best barbecue pit master, I need to have the best pigs. But I don't know anything about raising a pig. So um, so I figured, I said, but that was, that should be where I start first, right? Learn the, learn the network, learn how to, um, learn the farm. And this was back out, back in 2014, when I kind of came up with this idea about really kind of starting a farm for the restaurant, having no experience or knowledge about starting a farm or a restaurant. And, um, but as a ranger, we have this word called sua sponte, right? Grab the bull by the horns, do what you got to do, rock and roll. And so I decided that I would take on the hardest life profession and job and go ahead and handle it because guess what? I have nothing else to do except be a retired vet. And I went and I deep dive into this thing. And the more I learned, um, the more I wanted to share with other people. And so what I did was start my nonprofit, Stag Vets Inc. Um, and it's actually, the acronym is Strength to Achieve Greatness. And it's one of the things that I believe um, within the philosophy of my, um, of our core is that, you know, people, regardless of who you are, whether you're a veteran or non-veteran, you know, we all fall sometimes. We all fall and sometimes we fall so hard that we can't get up. And so Stag Vets Strength to Achieve Greatness, um, Veterans Inc., one of the things that um, I push into that core is the philosophy of being a ranger, which is you got to find it somewhere deep inside. You got to dig deep. You have to um, pull out the intestinal fortitude and go ahead and do it. And sometimes you're not going to have your friends or your family around. You have to do it on your own. And so with that philosophy and that mission mindset, it was to help um, veterans like myself serve self, team, and family um, along with our community in order to give back. And I think that's the biggest pro problem that we have with a lot of these other nonprofit organizations that I participated in. There wasn't a sense of service where veterans who are the 1% of you know, our country, we, 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 bear the, um, we bear the responsibility of the rest to protect the rest. We have this service mindset. And if we're not getting back into serving again, um, then, then, then we feel uh, hopeless. You know, we don't feel as um, as relevant. And so, it was important for me to um, create a system um, where veterans can come in and not feel and not have people feel pity for them, but have them be able to give back and to do what they do best, which is take care of of, of others. Um, so, I created Comfort Farms. Uh, Comfort Farms was named after my ranger buddy, Kali Comfort. It is not a place where vets come to sing Kumbaya in our fire pit, even though we do that. I try to tell people that, you know, there's no space, there's no place for comfort on comfort farms, probably at the road when you come in. Um, and people do say they kind of change once you walk in and all this kind of stuff. But what we actually preach on the farm is that you only grow when you're in discomfort you don't grow in your comfort. And so the things that, you are, that, that are causing you to have these, um, the, these meltdowns or these breakdowns are really because we don't have the tools. We have the tools to fight war, but we don't have the tools technically to communicate with our family members, to communicate with our, with, with, with our work environment. You know, um, there's a lot of things that's going back and forth in our own minds um, that, that causes this uh, sense of reality to pull us away from being productive. And so what we've, what we've seen over the past five years with Comfort Farms are veterans who actually come to this space and they're able to work on their issues to be better people. I know that most people that come to Comfort Farms will not be farmers, but everybody that comfort, comes to Comfort Farms learns the qualities and the techniques 
that we teach on the farm to become better people. Inadvertently, a lot of people want to become farmers because they have, there's, there's a certain type of, there's a certain magic in the air when you actually plant a seed, take care of an animal, and you do it when mother nature is punching you in the face every day. You know, um, what it does, obviously, just like war, when we go out, we have our risk mitigation, we understand what's going on. But the enemy has something different for us. And if you're not willing to bend and flex and move, you die. Simple. And the same thing with my guys who come to the farm. They have a plan. A lot of us are control freaks. We want to be able to control every single outcome. And as soon as you walk out that door, Mother Nature is hitting you in the face with a daggone cast iron skillet. Nope, that's not what's happening in the day. And that causes a lot of guys to be very uncomfortable because what they thought they were gonna do is not what they're gonna do because all the priorities are priorities and how do you prioritize all the top priorities, right? And so now you're in this situation where you have to figure it out and it's these small victories that we see with our veterans, both men and women who are coming out, who are handling these issues and who are changing the dynamic of how they work every day and becoming better people. Um, with that, I've coined a term called agrocognitive behavioral therapy. It's one of the things that I believe is going to be at the epicenter of helping veterans cope. Um, just like all of us have been conditioned to war um, and they use certain drills. Everybody knows what Fast Freddy would like, 25 meter target, 50 meter target, 100 meter target, right? When that silhouette pops up, it's conditioning you, conditioning you, conditioning you, muscle memory. Well, the same thing goes back to when a veteran has lost all of his or her ability for intimacy, for touch, for caring associated with people. One of the things that we do is we put them with, you know, like our, our mama sows, they're giving birth. Hey vet, you the guy who won't ever cry, it's your job to go ahead and take care of mama sow with her piglets every single day, making sure they're fed, making sure they're, they have the water and all that type of thing. There's this bridge that's built between an animal human connection that later transfers over to human and human connection where a, 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 a seasoned vet who doesn't have any ability wants to be around his family because of those things ends up building those skills through the farm. And it's, and it's amazing. And, um, and like I said, these are the type of things that um, I'm, I'm looking to do a lot more research on at the farm. We, we're getting a, a lot of success. We need to quantify it. It's one of those things. I, yes, I, I know it works, but um, in order to get the data to say that it works, these are some of the things that we're actually pushing forward. Um, as a business, I decided that I wasn't going to use sponsors and donors to keep us afloat. Five years ago, I said, number one, I was pretty much antisocial. I didn't want to talk, talk to to a lot of people coming out of the military. But one of the things, one of the things that I decided that I was going to do was create a robust agribusiness that would support the nonprofit. And so I believe, because I am a compassionate capitalist, that in order to be charitable, you need to be profitable. Period. Okay. Very good. So um, you need to be you need to be profitable. In order to make your profits we decide how charitable we're going to be. And the more charitable you are, or the more profitable you are, the more charitable you can be. And so it's the biggest thing that I'm not trying to, um, would we, as this model that we have, the, the business component of it um, on a five acre farm um, in 2019, we, on five acres, we generated just over $308,000 on a five acre farm. Um, and that's with our vegetables, that's with our animals, that's with our livestock. Um, it's with our program using our farm as a destination versus um, going out and, um, you know, supporting other farmers markets. We, we brought the farmers market to our farm, you know, and we have an on site because we want people to feel, to smell, to taste. Uh, with that other business component, um, I was just awarded um, just a little bit over a million dollars with the NIFA and, and, our, and, and our CS grant to create a school, which was my passion. That, on, that is on a great farm. success, John. Thank, Thank you. you. I appreciate it. And um, 
one of the things that I'm doing with this school is trying to turn into an agro-culinary academy. We had our first students come in this past uh, January as we started. There are nine students, eight of them are veterans. One of them is a financial um, guy from retired Merrill Lynch guy who saw me in the uh, newspaper, on the Washington's, on the, on the, yeah, Wall Street Journal and pretty much sold his stuff, came over to live in Milledgeville. Now he's attending school too. All to be um, a small sustainable agricultural technician, which is what we're offering in conjunction with Central Georgia Technical College, Fort Valley University, and Georgia College. Hey, so, John. Yes. I'm going to follow up with you during the Q&A session. And right now, I'm going to uh, interrupt, and I'm going to hand over the mic to Sheena Parker so she can tell us about, about um, Foresight Industries. Thank you, guys. Sheena? Good morning. Hi. Hey, everyone. Um, so yes, I'm Sheena Parker, and um, my business is Foresight Industries, <coughs> real estate and facility maintenance services for the federal government, local government, and corporate agencies. And our big six are janitorial, um, floor repair, roof repair, pressure washing, painting, landscaping. That's our big six. So I'm following after my, uh, my auntie Alyssa. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I've been in the Army. I'm still a current service member, 19 years. I'm a signal warrant officer. I don't know how I wandered over to facility maintenance, but I have uh, been in real estate for about seven years now. So that was kind of what was married up with, uh, with government contracting. When I started thinking about government contracting and I was already, already doing real estate, it kind of, it, it matched when it comes to like flipping and doing renovations and stuff like that. And I just absolutely love facilities. I love taking old buildings and making them beautiful again. That's actually our tagline, making buildings beautiful again. So as far as the military is concerned, like I said, I've been in 19 years in the signal field. I've been to Korea, Kuwait, Qatar, Japan, all that good stuff. And, you know, the military has been really, really good to me. I don't have a whole lot of horror stories, um, you know, and I appreciate people like, you know, John, who, who are able to take soldiers who have been affected in negative ways and, and help them get the help because I was, I've was i been at the VA, I have a lot of physical ailments and um, I know that it can be very challenging to uh, get the services that you need from the, uh, the, from the VA. So uh, with, my, with my business, I exclusively sell to the government or to corporate. My business is probably about 55% local contracting and 30% corporate and the remainder is federal because I'm still in the federal government. So I've been kind of careful with how I can, how I can manage that. But um, it's all been, it's, it's been an amazing experience. The last panel that I had with Miss Alyssa, I was saying, I hope I can get a contract one day. And now I'm about, I don't know, 15 contracts in and I'm crazy. I am like, I'm scared every day. I'm worried every day. I'm just kind of taking it as it goes and building the plane on the way down, you know? So it's, it's an amazing experience because I've been an entrepreneur my whole life. I started my very first business at 12, selling basketball and baseball cards. So I knew I had to wind up in something that would keep me busy. <laughs> and definitely anything with federal contracting keeps you very, very busy. One of the things that we've been focusing on um, as a collective with the, my community and with my employees and some of the people that I partnered with is second chance hiring. And of course, always, always looking to hire veterans. Um, we really want to get into sustainability for the local area, especially Atlanta with the gentrification and looking to uh, have those neighborhoods retained and being, uh, the, being the bank and actually um, offering alternate uh, house buying uh, purchase purchases. I'm sorry, I can't get my words. Um, alternate home buying options, so people are able to uh, be able to fund their homes, and then they retain their homes, and then they're able to actually pass those homes on. So that's something that we're looking to get into, and um, teaching those skills for life. If you're able to be handy, maybe you'll be able to keep your house up and then maybe you'll be able to retain your house. So that's kind of where we're at right now, where we're um, spread in about five different directions, all in the same wheelhouse, but five different directions when it comes to um, what, what facility maintenance means in, in the community. 
Sherman, you are up to bat. Thank you. Thank you, Sheena. Sherman, you're there we up go. to bat. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, thanks uh, very much, Eric, for this opportunity. I've uh, so far have learned some wonderful things from our panels. Uh, Jonathan, you can go ahead and sign me up. I'm in. Um, a little bit of, about me and uh, my history. Um, I was born in Ohio to the city of Toledo, Ohio, and graduated from high school, had a scholarship to a university to play football. Um, unfortunately, the coach told me I was not good enough, but being in the papers and being all world and everything, I felt I was good enough to play Big Ten football. Well, um, my parents said they didn't care where I went to school. I needed to go to a college and get my education. So I decided to uh, do what was best for me, which was join the military. Um, my parents thought that was a horrible idea from their experience, uh, being young, father being associated with the military for a very short period of time. Um, joined the military, spent 24 years in the military, uh, retired, decided to play golf for the rest of my life and decided after about a couple years that I'm bored. Um, a headhunter called me from a company called Johnson Controls. Mm -hmm. um, I ended up uh, getting a position as a national uh, plant budget manager. So I manage 11 pl plant budgets across the southern part of the United States from South Carolina to California. And I did that until 2009. And that's when the, the economy uh, tanked. And I was the last hired first release, which was okay. I mean, um, there are people that were there before me and had 17, 23, 32 years of uh, time in. And plus I'm a retired vet. I mean, you know, I'm okay with that. Uh, me and my, uh, ex-supervisor are still great friends now. Um, start playing golf again. My neighbor owned a company called Champion Building Products, and they had a division uh, that sold uh, doors to the housing authority industry. So he said, Jed, I heard you're not working. Hey, I need you to project manage for me. So I start project managing door um, applications and people, housing authorities buying hundreds and thousands of doors and I managed those projects. Well, this is what happened and why I got into door seals. I'm sitting around and I'm talking to two maintenance guys and they had a $400,000 budget to replace 350 doors. Well, each door cost about $1,000 to tear out the old door and install a new door. And we're talking and one maintenance guy said to the other maintenance guy, and I'm standing there. He said, well, you know what, if we just had a good piece of weather stripping to put around these doors, we wouldn't have to replace them all. And me being a common sense thinker, and let's just get it done um, I said to myself, well, why don't you guys just buy the good weather stripping and put them on the doors? So I didn't say anything. So I left and it, it stayed on my mind for about two weeks. Uh, then I had their, um, their project in front of me and I said, you know what, let me find these guys some good weather stripping so they can save money. So uh, one week goes by, I see weather stripping, the same weather stripping that's giving them problems. Two weeks go by and I'm starting to expand my search through the major weather stripping companies down to the mid majors. And they're all selling the repeat by weather stripping. So I said, there's gotta be a better way. So here's where my future in door seal started. So being that my dad was a carpenter in the summers, I really didn't have summers. I kind of had to get in the 
truck and, and go work. And I hated it because all my friends were traveling and playing. But now I appreciate it because things around the house I can repair and I don't have to pay someone to come in to do it anyway. So I designed a door seal um, that will seal an exterior door for about 20 years, no matter if the house or facility shifts, settles, or moves, same as shifting. That's what the current industry, what the government buys, what the universities buy, what the housing authorities buy, what um, commercial facilities buy, because that's what's out on the market today. So they don't know any better. So I said to myself, you know what? I'm going to start selling this weather stripping in my local area. So it went from me selling it to in my local area. It went from there to selling it regionally. From regionally, it's, it went to selling it nationally because I went directly to the end users. Well, why would I go to the end users? Because those are the people who feel the pain of writing those checks every month because of heating, man hours spent replacing door seals, uh, the AC usage loss, bugs getting in, those people write the checks. The people that receive money from government grants, uh, nonprofits, uh, they don't see the pain as much as the end user who actually has to say that's coming out of my own personal budget or money that I've been saving for decades or for months or for weeks or for years. So that's why from 2010, by the time 2012 um, was upon us, uh, we were selling it nationally. And the people that actually takes the time to, or took the time to listen to us are now saving money and reaping the benefits of using our door seals on their uh, facility doors. How did I get started? Let's go back to that. Um, I self-funded myself. Not everyone has the opportunity to self-fund. Uh, some people have to um, take loans, take out loans, borrow money from family members. Uh, fortunately for me, this is how I did it. And this is for people who are wanting to be entrepreneurs. Um, I had big dreams, but I had to start small. Well, what do you mean by that? I had an idea, created my idea, put it down on paper, created prototypes. Then I went to a customer and sold my idea. Once I got a purchase order from my first customer, I went and purchased the product that I was going to sell to them. So I didn't take $20,000 and and put something together and hope that I would successfully sell it. I went out and sold the idea. Uh, my wonderful first customer that I remember, I called them every year and, um, and talked to them. Because of them, I paid myself back in three weeks and I've been a debt-free company ever since. I've never taken a loan from a bank um, because I'm a steward of my money just because you have the money uh, doesn't mean you have to spend the money because there's going to be highs and lows within a business. And I would love for any entrepreneur, when you start a business, to have that low and say, Ooh, at least I have that money saved in the bank to get me through that low period and not just say, I have $100,000, I'm going to buy a car or or buy something you really don't need. Um, uh, challenges. Um, for me, my challenge is, guys, I'm a minority selling door seals in the United States. If you do your research, I'm the only minority who manufactures and sells door seals. But my history, my parents telling me, you have to always be twice as good or the best at what you do 
in order to compete in the US. That's what I've been taught. So when I design my weather stripping, it is, and none of the other weather stripping companies can deny it. Uh, it is the best door seal in the United States. It really is. It outperformed because I'm not a repeat by product. You put it on there, it lasts for decades. Then if, you, if something major happens to it, you buy a replacement piece and you keep going. You don't take the old weather stripping off, throw it in the landfill and buy new seals. Uh, all my products are made from recycled materials. So it's recyclable. Sure, man. I'm looking at the green side of, of, of business. Um, Sherman? Yes. I'm going to, I'm going to interrupt you. I got to give, I got to give, I love your story. This is great. And I want to follow on the Q and A okay. at the end, but I want to give Bridget a chance to tell us about her company. I'll Bridget, stand. thank you. Wow. Um, everyone that spoke before, this is such amazing uh, narratives. I know you all in the business industry, but some of this, the stories I don't get to hear. And so I'm very excited about that. I was trying to take notes. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Bridget McCoy. I'm CEO and founder of Women Veteran Social Justice Network. I'm also a solopreneur. What most people don't know about me is I am a serial entrepreneur. Um, my whole life I've been, uh, I heard someone say, uh, Sheena was saying she was selling uh, things that, when she was a, a youngster and pretty much uh, I used to sell candy and pickles uh, in, in school <laughs> when I was in elementary school. I got in trouble for it a couple of times, uh, but I always had an, uh, an idea that I wanted to um, provide a value to others. I didn't always know what that meant um, and I probably didn't have the language um, that I have now to describe that. Um, but most times when I meet people who want to be entrepreneurs, they feel like I have to have this uh, big, you know, audacious I idea that I've already put into practice and I've already made money for to be an entrepreneur. And I have to tell them, if you have uh, the desire to do those things, you are, I don't know why my eye is watering. Uh, if you have the desire to do those things uh, and, and you, um, sincerely want to, like uh, Sherman said, you know, provide uh, value to an end user, like in, in, by creating some idea or some product or some service, you already are an entrepreneur, you just need to develop that, okay? So um, I was in the army, I, uh, fourth generation military uh, veteran, uh, people always say, oh, how can you know that? Um, I've researched to find, you know, where my grandparents, great grandparents, where the, the men served. And now I'm on a, a path to find out where the women served, right? Because that's a part of my mission for Women Veterans Social Justice Network. Uh, I served in the Army three years. I was a data telecommunications specialist. Um, uh, I, I would have served longer, but because of some injuries that happened to me in the military, it was just best for me to go ahead and leave and begin my journey academically. And so I spent a few years, I thought I wanted to be a counselor, right? Uh, and, but there was always a gnawing of like, I wanna have multiple businesses. I wanna do something else. So I was going to school to, to learn to be a counselor, but I was had a side hustle, right? And so many of you uh, have ideas and concepts that you're, you know, a, applying in the general population. You're, you know, you're like some, like Sherman, I think it was, uh, he was saying, one of the gentlemen was saying he, he wanted to be a, a pit master. And so you have these ideas and it's like, how do you put them to, how do you put them into practice? And so, you know, the time between me actually starting WVSJ and getting out of the military was some 20 some odd years. But initially it was just the, the sheer, um, what I experienced as a woman veteran was there weren't any resources and services that were crafted um, with me in mind. And so when I started WBSJ, it really was just me wanting, saying, hey, there are people um, that are probably experiencing the same thing I am. I wonder where they are. And if I can find them, I wonder how we can help each other. And if we can help each other, I wonder how we can make it better for others that come behind us. I mean, that was basically the basic premise. Um, but what I did in that process was um, I did a lot of um, virtual listening sessions. And um, you gotta remember when I started in 2008, there was nobody was doing virtual anything. So we were a, you know, we were spearheading a lot of things. Um, we were considered kind of crazy because one, we were using the term social justice. So people had trouble with that. And 
and then a uh, women veteran, you know, why would I, why was I breaking off from men and trying to do something? And it was like, none of those things mattered to me. It was, I was firmly focused on what I could do for women veteran. And so um, when we get into the uh, products and services of women veteran social justice network, uh, sometimes people have a challenge with that as well, because we, we don't hand out widgets. We don't, you know, pass turkeys out at, to homeless during, you know, uh, Veterans Day. We don't do any of that kind of stuff, but more of our work is intellectual. And so we bring women um, veteran into the community and teach them um, how to be philanthropists, how to be uh, civically minded and engaged, running for office. Um, we show them how to take their ideas and concepts and, uh, you, you know, for entrepreneurship and bring them to the market. Uh, but we do this in an interesting way. We allow them to come into our sandbox of WVSJ. We give them the digital literacy that they need, the digital tools that they need so that they can also um, be like now where we are um, in, a, in a space where we have to use technology to get things done. So they can be far more advanced in um, executing their business plans or their, their, their work. And so uh, we, have, um, we have absolutely leveraged um, the idea of in-kind donations. We've had two national uh, conferences. Both of them were co-sponsored by uh, major universities here in uh, Atlanta, Georgia Tech University and um, Kennesaw um, University. And then most recently we had our, our two uh, conferences where we, you know, again, partnered with universities in South Carolina and in uh, Richmond, Virginia. So we, we just leveraged that uh, ability to connect um, the reconnect the community. We mirror the behaviors of corporate leadership. We mirror the behaviors of uh, executing business plans and, and ideas. And we give women an opportunity to be in senior leadership. I know that a lot of the organizations have leadership programs and they're, you know, they facilitate really great because I've been a mentor in a lot of them. But what I kept seeing um, specifically with our women veteran and business leadership um, is that there were gaps in understanding. And so uh, a lot of the, the programming is introductory leadership. We kind of already got that under wrap um, in the military. We needed something that was gonna bridge the gap between um, the introductory moving to um, intermediate um, knowledge, right? And so we have the, emer the ad ad aspiring, the ad advancing and the emerging kind of spaces where we're helping women to understand that where they fit. So there's some situational awareness some self-awareness that happens and then where, where they're trying to go to. And then we match them with other resources and services out there. And so I scour all the different programs to see what's going on um, in the community because I know as a, a life coach, I can only give people a certain amount of um, insight. Um, I'm not a hospitality person, so I can't tell you how to run a hospitality specific business, but I can get you to the point where you can be effective so that you, when you get to someone who's in that area, they can help you. Um, as a woman veteran, uh, nonprofit leader and a solopreneur, I find that uh, our, it's, it's gonna be necessary. So I'm speaking to the folks who's, who are listening at this point um, related to wanting to start a business. You're gonna have to be innovative. You can no longer look at um, just something as a brick and mortar. Even if it is a brick and mortar, you're going to have to have um, digital literacy. You're going to have to know how to use the tools to automate your business. Because if you do not know how to automate your business in this in this economy, you will um, you will lose the business that you already have that you're trying to establish before you even get there. And the data shows that you know the first three or four years, people you know we're we're launching businesses. Um, women specifically, women veteran are launching great businesses, um, but we but we are not having sustained businesses for 10 and 15 and 20 years. And so we want to see, you know, uh, I think Sherman brought it to the, uh, talked about that, having a, a product that you bring to market that you are the best at, that you're, um, that uh, you are known for, but also that you have sustainability and that it does the environment, uh, mm -hmm. good, you know, good. So, um, it was something else I wanted to say. Oh, I, I want to brag a little bit. Someone bragged a little bit, but uh, we were, um, because of our work that we do, we were um, um, an honoree. We are an honoree for the Medal of Honor Society's uh, community service. Uh, and so we will be receiving that medal sometime this year. And so I'm just very excited and appreciative 
um, for everyone because a lot of the work that we do is with corporate responsibility. We go to organizations and say, you don't have a, a, a women veteran focus. You don't have a veteran focus. Let us show you how to do that. And let us show you how to help your, um, your employees give to the community through these different platforms. And there are a multiplicity of platforms. And so that's how we've been able to, because um, people say, oh, don't you have grants? Don't you have all of these different things? You don't have a brick and mortar. I was like, why would we spend money for brick and mortar when our women veteran don't typically go to brick and mortars anyway? That yeah. is not the use of our, our, our um, funding. So we have just figured out how to kind of, um, we, I bootstrapped it, of course, at the beginning, but we've been very fortunate to um, have, you know, veteran-owned businesses, uh, corporate businesses to come alongside of us. And while they may not give us money, they may give us a space. Where they might not give us a space, they may give us resources. So we've been very fortunate. Um, um, this is our 13th year. And, yeah. and coming from a woman veteran who is a disabled veteran, um, you know, it's, that's a pretty big deal. But the bigger deal is that we see on the other end, women um, having, you know, success. So thank you. Bridget, we're in awe of you. Thank you. Uh, I, I'd like to ask John Thomas to join us now. John Thomas and I have something in common. We both used to work at Coca-Cola, if, if I remember correctly. And you right. left a, a career in human resources at Coca-Cola to become an entrepreneur. Yes. Uh, first you were in the army, then you went to Coca-Cola. That's great. Tell us, tell us your story. Yeah. So, uh, John Thomas, uh, army veteran here, uh, did a couple tours, um, in Iraq and, and, and yes. Yeah, so, so, um, initially I, I took a, a little crazy path to get where I am today, but, but I left, I left the military. Um, mind you, like a lot of, a lot of folks, um, I started, um, my military career, right out of high school. Um, so I did about 12 years in the military. Um, and after my last tour in Iraq, I decided to leave the military. Um, and it was, things had changed. Uh, minimum wage went up a little bit, but um, other than that, uh, I felt like almost I was starting from um, where I was those 12 years before when I, when I, I left high school, didn't know how to do, you know, a resume or, you know, didn't, because I was field artillery, more combat arms, I didn't have any real skills um, outside of, well, I thought, I'll say that, I thought I didn't have any real skills. Um, but, but one thing I did have was something that my grandmother told me um, when she used to make us pick up cans <laughs> um, uh, for, for money. And she said, well, if you can't find a job, make a job. If you can't find a way, make a way. Um, and that's one of the things that, that stuck with me um, so, uh, after I left the military, um, that's what I did. I, I took a little bit of my TSP money, if any of y'all know what that is, that I saved up in Iraq and, um, I started selling stuff online. This was back in the days of eBay when eBay was booming and, and a few of the, the, this was probably before Amazon really got big, but you know, I would, I would literally, um, I had no money. So I would literally go on to other sites and find sales and get the products and resell them. And I literally, I built a business from just reselling, um, you know, guests or BCBG, uh, things like that. Uh, and, and so I, I ended up uh, landing a job at Coca-Cola while working in HR. Uh, I was a, a regional recruiter uh, for most of the, the Southeast. Um, and my, my big jump, into entrepreneurship really came during the, the crash of 2008. Um, I remember being in the HR um, side and, and we're literally going through files and files and files of people that we had had to lay off uh, just because the economy was so bad. And, and even though I didn't get laid off, I said, okay, I need to get back into <laughs> to entrepreneurship. And so that's kind of when I, I, I picked, it, picked it back up. Um, um, I've always been been tech savvy. Uh, I've always had, like I said, some type of business acumen. Um, I was listening to to a, a few people's story, uh, you know, Bridget and, and Sheena, and I, I think we all kind of have, as an entrepreneurs, we all kind of have that urge. Very young, um, I was the kid in first and second grade 
selling bubble gum, I realized if you get the bubble gum and you break it into five pieces, as opposed to selling the pack, that you can make more money. So <laughs> I, I had a little briefcase and I had all my different bubble gum. So that was uh, me and my friend, we moved from, long story, but we moved from bubble gum to selling school candy and, and, and wholesale. And then we figured out if we buy it from from Sam's and some of the other ones, we could actually make more money that way. So, so I've always had that that entrepreneur spirit. Um, and so, after Coca Cola, I, I I decided um, um, that I would do that again. So I started a um, commercial commercial cleaning company, janitorial. I've been doing uh, mostly commercial. Like a lot of people, I've I've gotten so wrapped up in doing the commercial side. We have a, a good client base. Um, and, and, uh, most of our, our, our business has been word of mouth over, over the years. So I really never had a chance to sit down and get into the government, the government contracting side, because I remember getting into it. I think I hadn't had two years in it. I'm gung ho and I didn't really know the regs and, and I didn't know what I had to do to, to get into government contracting. So I just kind of, kind of put it, put it to the side, um, but but of course, as as time goes on, you you learn you learn things. So um, I'm I'm here in Atlanta, and one of the things that I really really enjoy doing is um, outside of running my business. My one of my big passions is helping veterans um, and and the 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 underserved get into business. Not also into business, but into the to technology. Um, halfway through my business, I kind of got burned out. Um, if some of you know, being being a sole a sole owner can be a really a really challenging thing. So halfway through, probably the six year mark, five or six year mark, I, I really got I really got burned out uh, because I didn't realize some of those things that we'll probably talk about here, as far as putting systems in place, putting processes in place, having the right people, right, learning how to delegate. I didn't know I didn't really get those things. I was more of a hustler. So we just, you know, you just do it. So, so I got burned out and I took a little time off and I, I jumped back into the technology side. I became a, uh, uh, a certified uh, database developer. Um, and, and from there, I built a, a couple applications. Uh, a lot of people know uh, one of my bigger ones, uh, Red Bag, Red Bag Gifts. Um, it's a gifting application. Uh, uh, so I have two or three applications in, in, um, I also started a web development company, God, maybe about about nine years ago of just helping other people build websites, build mobile apps. Um, and, and recently, because of COVID, uh, it's actually started to take off. And, and what we've done um, essentially is created a program, a business in a box, sort of, so to speak, that actually helps veterans and uh, underserved get into business ownership themselves. So, you know, we help them, you know, build a website, uh, get all your legal documents uh, together, uh, you know, go to the secretary of state, uh, set up the social media. So what we want to do is help people avoid a lot of those stuck points or those, those pitfalls uh, into getting started in business. A lot of people don't know. You need to have your business set up from the beginning your accounting set up from the beginning. So when it's time to get your certification or it's time to go after business funding, all of your things are in place. So, so like I said, one of my things, my, my big joys is really helping people, you know, start into this journey, but, but doing it right. Um, um, you know, I, I did a lot of things wrong. I'll, I'll be the first to admit it. Um, and, and so it, it really brings me joy to kind of help people, you know, get in, get into business and, and get into the technology space. Thank you very much, John. That's very inspiring. And, and, uh, you know, I'm looking at our panelists, all kinds of serial entrepreneurs. This is what it, it tells me. A lot of people started when they were little kids. I started mowing lawns. Somebody else was start picking up cans. Somebody else was selling bubble gum, you know, pickles. I think it's wonderful. Uh, I've, I've done some entrepreneurial stuff myself, but I'm not that interesting. I'm going to, we, we're coming up to the next section of our program. We've asked John Perkins, who is the director of certification and Veri verification for the Veterans Administration to join us today and tell us how we can go about, if we want to follow in your footsteps, 
how can we go about becoming a an entrepreneur and getting certified with the Veterans Administration? So, so John, are you are you teed up there? I, I think so. Can you hear me and see me? We can hear you, and I'll I'll be quiet so we can see. You. Now we can see you, and and uh, you tell me when you want to when to switch over to the slides, and I'll get it teed up. Uh, they don't want to see my face, so yes, uh, let's go ahead and tee it up. This is a Navy face, so we don't want to have all U.S. Army looking at a Navy face for too long. So I was I was told I have a face for radio. I have a I have a retired Navy face, so I've got to get rid of this. So if you bring up the slides right now, that'd be great. Um, my name is uh, John Perkins, as, as stated, and I am the director for the Center for Verification and Evaluation. Uh, and uh, that process is with the VA, the Veterans Administration. And there's a couple of distinctive differences on our, um, is this, are the slides up yet? No, no, not quite. Hang on one second. Okay, I'll wait. There we go. Okay. Um, I am the director for the Center for Verification and Evaluation, and I don't want to take too long, but I'm going to go over the process for getting verified through the VA, the VA program. It is, it is a verification I process. It, it is not it is not a uh, self-certification process the way the SBA has. And I'll try to go over the distinctive difference there. Next slide, please. Before I do anything, any sailor, any self-respecting sailor has to do a, a sea story. Um, and hopefully it'll have an applicable point to this. I was the combat cargo officer on the LSD-40, the Fort Fisher. And one of my jobs was is to help get Marines to the shore uh, during a couple of operations over on a deployment in 96, right after Osama bin Laden bombed one of the uh, embassies in Africa. And one of the things that the Marines were most worried about is whether or not they would have enough toilet paper to uh, have enough supplies while they were put ashore on their amphibious Amtrak vehicles coming out of the stern of the uh, Fort Fisher. So not only did I get to launch them, but I also had to make sure that they had certain supplies. Now I wasn't required to give them toilet paper, but they were going to find it because Marines on a ship, they don't have a whole lot to do. So going through all the, the heads and, and taking all of my toilet paper was one of their first missions before they went to, to, uh, to shore. Uh, and so as they left to go to a, a real world operation in Somalia, uh, they would start taking the toilet paper to supply everybody so everybody had everything that they needed. Um, and my supply petty officer kept coming to me and saying, sir, no matter how much we put in the heads, they steal it. So finally, I gathered everybody on the back of the, of the ship called the uh, flight deck, got all the Marine contingent there, everybody that was on the ship that was a Marine and said, look, guys, I am going to show you the entire group, all of your supply chain, and I have more than enough toilet paper that I can hand you boxes before you depart for your op. And I want to make sure that you understand to stop taking out of my heads because you're driving my petty officers crazy that are supposed to keep you guys supplied in our heads on the ship. So when you leave, I'll give you a couple of cases. I promise. So I took their supply petty officers, they're not supply petty officers, supply sergeants up to my focusal, showed them the boxes and boxes that I had that, I could, that there's no way we're running out no matter what we do on this cruise. And then I went back there and said, now look, here are the boxes I'm gonna to give to you before you leave, stop taking it out. And my point here is this, that it, like any other organization, when you're going through our process, communication is the key. So you, you contact our processors, our case analysts, and you listen to what they're asking for, you ask questions, but communication is the key, just like me getting on that bullhorn and all of those young Marines just laughing their heads off at this, uh, at, at this uh, 03, trying to make sure that everybody understood what I was trying to get across, communication back and forth is the key. Okay, there it is, next slide, please. Uh, the mission for CVE is to consistently and de deliver accurately and timely veteran applications through integrated service process and technology. We need to be veteran friendly. Uh, we are the VA. The technology needs to be easy to use. The processes, they have to go by the regulation. And I will be honest at this point right now. 
our process is fairly robust and that the regulation requires a lot of different documentation that we look at and verify. And a lot of veterans find it uh, onerous, intrusive, and long. Uh, but like most good uh, Navy folks that follow regulations, most good Army folks that follow regulations, I know what the regulation is and I have to follow it. Um, I am required by regulation to meet uh, a 90 day application uh, uh, timeline when, when applicable is what the regulation says. So if I've got all the resources, I'm supposed to answer that bell. And we have not had any late cases in years now because we've had enough resources to do all the applications. Uh, having said that, what application days mean is that when we are on clock time on us, when we've got all the documentation and everything we've asked from the veteran, that's called application time. If a veteran has something that they're supposed to give us, but does not give it to us like for a month, that doesn't count on that application time because we can't control when veterans, sometimes they have other things come up and it's not a priority. They have business they have to run and they're not ready to complete the process and that's fine. But the way the regulation is, is worded is it's application time. So that's minus vet, vet time that the vets are, are expected to do something, either give us an explanation or, or turn in a operating agreement or maybe a bylaw. We try to have high quality customer service, point number three in our goal, proactive, accessible, timely. And if you go back one other uh, time, understand that when I say consistent in the mission, that means that if, if every, everything's the same, in other words, your documents are the same as a, a, another company, by and large, you're a single owner, uh, uh, you're a single owner LLC, and you have everything the same, we want to deliver the same results, if that makes sense. We, we look at how we've decided other things in the past and actually try to make the same decision based on the same evidence that we see coming in case by case. Uh, we look at ownership and accountability of all services. We, we understand that we have knowledgeable staff. We believe we have knowledgeable staff. We have a customer service uh, telephone number. You should have gotten a flyer through this invite so you know where to contact if you desire to go ahead and want to do our process. Um, and we want to maximize SDVOSB and VOC access to contracting opportunities. And I'll add one statement in there. Our program is for folks that are trying to get VA contracts. If you're getting, if you want to just go ahead and get a contract, and this is the distinctive difference in, in some other area of the federal government, let's say DOD, you don't need a VA certification. You can go to the SVA process and be what we call self-certified. I'll add one more caveat. There is a law in the NDA 2021 that states that we are going to be moving the VA process or the government will from the verification process at the CVE. That requirement will become the SBA requirement uh, within two years. And so at some point, the SBA will be doing verification, not self-certification. Next slide, please. Sorry, I jumped one. <laughs> uh, that's that's uh, okay. So I'm not going to take long on the org chart other than to say we have uh, a verification support process that that has a call center uh, that's open most business days uh, at normal working hours on the East Coast time. We have uh, contracts to support us in in areas like when we have to do cases all the way up to OHA, which is the Office of Hearing Appeals on the SBA side. Um, and that is, our, that is our organization that when we have an appeal that, that a veteran says, I don't agree with your finding, you've denied me, I want to appeal to a higher authority. There's a panel of judges called the Office of Hearing and Appeals that does that. And that's at the SBA. And that's our, that's our folks that work that process. Uh, mm -hmm. Verification is our lead process. We have, these are all the veteran, uh, I'm sorry, not the veteran, but the, the federal case workers, that's the, the center column for verification is our process there. We also have contract partners that help us with that. But every single case is looked at by a veteran. Uh, it's not just, I'm not sure to say just, but there are contractors that, that collect everything, review everything, and then there's a federal review process to make sure that every case has federal eyes on it before it comes up to me for signature. 
risk and compliance, we actually have site visits that we're allowed to do by, by regulation. And that's where uh, once you are approved or sometimes before you're approved, we'll send out a team to your site. If they come on onto your site, what they're doing is they're just doing what we call a site visit. Um, and that is allowed by regulation. And that helps us keep um, some semblance of risk down uh, to, to ensure what, what everybody's saying is what actually is. And that's not uh, saying that uh, we're not accusing anybody of anything. It's just kind of a, a, a verification process, almost like um, just, just an on-site uh, evaluation. And we do that uh, to make sure that the, the program has uh, a, a good way of, of showing credibility uh, in many different aspects. Next slide, please. Um, the verification team process application for veteran-owned small business at SDVOSB and VOSB. You'll hear me talk about those two acronyms. We have a, a contract partner, GCC Technologies, uh, that does the initial review. And then, like I said, federal review team validates the contractor's findings. Next slide, please. Verification support team handles all of the customer service angles like I talked about. They've got the call center. They've got uh, legal inquiries. They've got uh, uh, congressional inquiries. They've got appeals and protests. Uh, and they also collect metrics for me. Next slide, please. Uh, the risk team, I've talked about that, uh, works closely with these different areas. They do cancellation. The cancellation is when we actually say that somebody that's in our database that's gone through the system, there's been a report uh, and we then give them a pro process. Any, any veteran that gets a cancellation notice, they have due process of being able to answer any accusations that have been made against their company uh, through the cancellation process. Next slide, please. These are our customers. I'll let you digest that because I've only got uh, about 17 minutes left and I wanna to get to the process. Next slide, please. This is the public law. Uh, this was established uh, way back in 2010 or so, uh, stating that the VA would have a, a veterans first contracting program. Um, in 2018, our uh, ownership and control part of that was moved to the SBA. They are now in control of the ownership and control portion of our, our regulation. Um, again, right now, it's a VA requirement to do verification, but again, the NDAA 2021 is moving that within two years to the SBA. So that will move and they will then be required to do verification. And this entire law has been basically changed by the NDAA, the, the 109-461. Next slide, please. Um, like I said before, the 38 CFR part 74 is what tells us how we're supposed to do this process. And I don't wanna stay on the law because everybody starts falling asleep. 13 CFR part 125 is what the SBA owns. And like I said, in October, 2018, they became the authority on ownership and control. And this also required their OHA, Office of Hearing Appeals, to be our appeal authority. That was all part of the 2018 NDAA. Next slide, please. Okay, here's an eyesore, and it's an eye chart. These are all the different uh, uh, parts that we have to look at in each and every different application. These are the subparts of everything we look at, and they're in big buckets. So if you see the bolded parts, we look at a veteran status first, so that if you're not a veteran, uh, that's the front gate. And we, we need a DD-214 that is not, and I will be very specific on this, it can't be guard only time. So if you only came into boot camp and you only did guard time, you never were on active duty beyond initial training, uh, and you were a guard only individual or a reserve only individual, uh, and never had Title X time, you are not eligible for this program by law, okay? Wow. And that, that's hard. That really is hard because it, 
it, it does cut out uh, uh, Guard and Reserve uh, folks uh, that that's all that they've done. They've done their Guard and Reserve time and they've done great work for their states and their reserve component, but they never came on active duty uh, at any time in their career. And that's hard. And I've had to have a lot of very difficult conversations with veterans uh, that were Guard and Reserve component or reserve component only, title, title 32, never title 10. And that's a tough um, uh, conversation to have. Uh, but that is a law. That is the way Congress described how they want uh, the VBA side of this to go, Veterans Benefits Administration. They're the ones that make that determination, not CVE. Uh, and that acronym Burles is where the, the database that we go to um, have, uh, uh, that's, that's the database we look to see if somebody has active duty time. Uh, good character has to be established. Uh, financial obligations can't have any federal liens, significant federal liens. Legal organization is established. Veterans are established. Then ownership has to be established, a 51% minimum. Then we go into the control elements, um, and I'm not going to go over each individual sub-element on all of this. This is a large slide. Uh, the next few slides will go into all of the different sub-elements of each one of these subcategories underneath the major items. So the major items are veteran status, general eligibility with those sub-bullets, ownership has to be 51% with those sub-bullets, and then control is one of the big ones. Um, so then uh, underneath of that, that specific uh, link that I've got at the below uh, on this slide is where all of the requirements of all the documents that you have to gather before you even come in. So if you're an LLC, let's talk about that. You're going to be looking for your operating agreement. But if you are a, uh, uh, an incorporation, you're going to be looking for your bylaws, your shareholder agreement. And that's where you would go to find all the, all the stuff that you're going to need for that part of the process. Where am I at in timing? Oh, 11 minutes. We've got to move. Next slide. You're, you're okay. We're, we're, we'll work. It, it's not down to the minute. You ready? Okay. Yep. Next slide, please. Because we're going to just go into all these different elements on the next few slides. Veteran st status. I described that uh, already. Uh, service disabled status. Uh, that comes from the VA. You, you need a service connected rating between zero and 100%. Uh, and that would be uh, a letter, and then the VA will know that, and they will be able to see it in that Burroughs um, database. Uh, next slide, please. It's, uh... it's thinking. Up oh, there it yeah, is. General it's requirements. Thinking. Yep. General requirements. Good character. Uh, good character means you can't be disbarred or suspended. Uh, owned or controlled by debarment or suspended persons or are ineligible from the VIP verification. That's business disbarred. Financial obligations, I talked about that. No unresolved tax liens, those kind of things. Here's a big one now. You have to be SAM registered, uh, Systems for Award Management. If you are not SAMs registered, you're not going to get into the front door. You're not going to get through what we call our intake stage. Uh, next slide, please. Um, uh, direct ownership has to be direct, meaning it can't be through like a trust, right? You can't have a trust uh, and that trust be uh, a concern or principal owner by any other business or entity. Uh, now, there are elements where you can have a trust, but you're going to have to have total control over that trust. And I won't get into the sub elements on that because you have to be like the trust, you have to be the, the grantor, the grantee, those kind of things on the trust. Direct ownership without a trust is the easier path. That's what I'm trying to say. So um, uh, yes, unconditional ownership. You can't have conditions where your ownership can be removed by an outside entity. I'll, I'll leave it at that. But unconditional ownership, if there's a condition on the ownership, meaning if you do X, you can have your ownership removed that may not fly for the direct for the unconditional ownership part of our eligibility. Dividends and distributions, 
The key word there is entitled. The, the regulation says entitled. You have to be entitled. doesn't mean you have to take 51%, but you have to be entitled. So that's, that's another issue. Um, uh, next slide, please. I apologize for that. Uh, um, I'm getting messages that shouldn't be coming up, but all right. Uh, control. Okay, this is the big one that uh, 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 gets kind of confusing for everybody, but I'll try to go through it and make it kind of simple. Control has some sub elements. Number one, daily management. Your daily business operations of the business has to have uh, where you have control over the decision making. You, you are able to cash checks. You're the ones that are cashing the checks. You'll be asked for uh, proof that you are running business meetings, that, that you have the ability to control uh, um, any kind of meeting that you have within uh, the body of your business, meaning that you have meeting minutes. You might, uh, like I said, cash checks. You're the signatory on those checks. You're the one that the bank expects to sign. Uh, you sign your lease, those kind of things. Next, highest officer. Uh, must hold the highest officer position. And that can be simply uh, stated in your operating agreement or your bylaws or designated in meeting minutes, but you have to show that you are the highest officer. Uh, uh, managerial experience. If you are saying that you're going to run an IT business, but you are a surface warfare guy like me, and you ran ships and passed out toilet paper, that's probably not an IT experience. So I might not pass managerial experience. Now, some of these things to include managerial experience, you can say are rebuttable. So that means rebuttable means that that means you can, you can put in a statement saying, yeah, I passed out toilet paper and I may not know how to run an IT business, but I can manage. And here's where I've managed businesses. So some of that can be rebuttable, but not all of it. Uh, control of decision-making. I always call this the mother may I test, control decision-making, meaning that you, you don't have to ask permission from another owner that you can sign a check for $10,000 or even $1,000, uh, that you are the bottom line person, the veteran uh, does not have to mother may I back to any other entity. And that goes to decision-making authority in your bylaws, your state, your state, uh, your shareholder agreements, your operating agreements. If you're not the, the managing member that has control over uh, signing checks, um, uh, spending money, uh, those, kind of it, those kind of things, then you may not have control over decision-making. And that, that can be a trip up if you have like a 49% or even a multi-owner, let's say there's four members and you don't have what we call uh, override authority of the other three non-veteran members, you're probably not gonna have control of decision-making. The veteran or the SDVOSB has to be able to just make a decision and not mother may I back to anybody else in the company. I'm hoping that makes sense. Non-veteran control is what we call uh, the pass-through issue. So, uh, if uh, you have a non-veteran control issue, that's where uh, you might have, let's say, a former uh, person that used to run a construction company that's now come on your construction company. And that individual still works as an operating uh an operations manager on another construction company and there's a tie-in and non-veteran control would be the example of where the veteran uh, unfortunately thinks that it's okay to start up a construction company, but using all of the equipment of a larger construction company, that's called pass-through and that's non-veteran control and that is not allowed. Another example of non-veteran control, and this frustrates a lot of veterans, is if you're running a franchise 
and I'll pick on McDonald's because that's a classic franchise. Typically, a franchise like McDonald's has vet, non-veteran control because McDonald's is going to tell you, you will operate a business and have a menu with Big Macs on it. Well, that's non-veteran control. You have to sign that you're going to do business their way. You don't have control of decision-making. You, you have to make the Big Mac their way. You have to sell the Big Mac their way. You have to have golden arches their way. So that becomes um, an issue that uh, uh, shows non-veteran control. Uh, and that then becomes control of decision-making and not veteran control. And then if you had a franchise like that, you would find that you would be, get a letter from us saying that you're not qualified for our program because of a couple of things. Uh, you don't have really daily management because there's certain things you can't manage day to day. Maybe you might not have veteran uh, control of decision making because McDonald's is going to tell you how to run it. And there's non-veteran control because you can't make the decision not to have a Big Mac on the menu. Uh, yeah, I, I see Eric nodding. Yes. So I'm hoping that that point gets across. It's 1127. I got to move next. size you have to be uh you have to be uh small in size based on the sba standard you cannot be what we call other than small there's a north american uh north american industry classification standard called next code and we calculate that based on the sba process and if you're not small in size you cannot be in our program i'll have to move on from there next slide please Ooh, something's building long. Ugh. Oh, our process. It's a, it's a long build and I apologize. It helped me get a chance to catch my breath. In a, in a. In Is there a, anything else on it or does it flip the slide? No, it's everything's on there. Okay. Um, Uh, and I want to apologize for the dings that you've been hearing in the background, but I, I actually, I was COVID positive a month ago. And because of that, I have a, a heart issue going on. And I'm supposed to record when I'm struggling with uh, some things breathing. And so that's what's going on. It's telling me to record it. Apologies. Uh, introduction to verification. The application process is in four different phases. The veteran owner creates application and uploads the required documents. The owners then uh, sign a 0877. That document is then uh, uploaded into our system and the intake analyst then takes a look at all of that and makes sure that the 0877 is signed correctly and uh, then the uh, intake analyst uh, looks at all of the proof of the, that the veteran has most of the stuff in the system, all of the different uploaded documents that I described, and then sends that over to the green process, which is the case analyst. The case analyst process is the heart and soul of it. That's where the case analyst looks at all the documents that I talked about that you have to send in and that's it's, it's volume. So if you look at that checklist, you're sending in your operating agreement, three years of taxes, your resume, um, a lot of other documentation. I won't go into all that. I don't have time. We're running out of time. Case analyst looks at it and if there's any problems with it or if there's any issues, uh, they will get back with you and say, you need to give us an explanation on this, or you need to provide us uh, an explanation, a letter of explanation on these different issues. And if there are issues that can't be resolved, you may go to a senior analyst that will then give you an opportunity in our process to make some changes to an operating agreement based on the fact you may have non-veteran control or maybe you don't have control of decision-making in one of your documents. So we give you a process within our process 
that allows you to make changes to business documents. Um, excuse me. Uh, and then uh, that case analyst and process allows you to make changes and that those changes then are sent back to the case analyst. And then if the, the changes are fixed, you go on possibly to get an approval letter, but if not, you may get a denial letter. Like I said, the whole process, we have to do it within 90 days. But uh, actually that process uh, can and usually does take about 30 days on average. Uh, it's ranging up to about 35 days now with COVID uh, to get back to the veteran. At the end, then the Fed reviewer takes a look at all of this. And as, if everything's good and well, that Fed reviewer then uh, sends uh, through the process to me that, that everything looks good. And hopefully I sign out a decision letter of approval. We'll get that back in about 35 days. But this is the four step process, the four phases. You're adding all your documents in, the intake analyst looks at everything, the case analyst then takes a look at any clarifying information that you might need. Uh, like I said, you have some areas where you can rebut uh, that maybe you have a, a, a situation where your business is not directly, you're not there every day, but you can give us information that you have like this, a Skype meeting, or you have uh, meeting minutes, or maybe you're not the highest paid and you need to give us a re rebuttable presumption that you sign out a letter of explanation to us. All those things may be asked for in letters of explanation. All of that is then put back into the case analyst and the case analyst then uh, uh, looks at it and if it answers all the questions, that is um, then put into the system and answered. And then I get a final decision on how the case is going. Our, our denial rate is very low. Uh, if you go through the whole process and get everything we need, our denial rate is less than 90, not less than 4%. A couple of years ago when we didn't allow changes, it was upwards of uh, 40%. Uh, and, and we're pretty proud of our, uh, some people say proud isn't a good word, but we're pretty happy with our customer service uh, at the above 96% uh, uh, and above acceptance rate. Very few people get denial letters because, oh, by the way, in the process, if there's something you can't fix, we allow you to withdraw at any time. You can just withdraw and then come back uh, and all your documents are there and you can just try to fix the, the process over time. So maybe you have Maybe you have a, a, an owner that doesn't want to make the changes inside of five days and wants to think about it. That's fine. Just withdraw, take your time, make the changes, and then come back into the process. Uh, next slide, please. Our operating system, our software is called VEMS, Veteran Enterprise Management System. Uh, it initially rolled out in June of 2018. It's a pretty good system. It's got its bugs. There are some upfront bugs. Uh, you have to have either uh, ID me or uh, you have to be through the certified.gov system. Uh, you have to have one of those two dif different ways of getting through the front door to prove who you are. Uh, if you have problems with that, you can call our uh, one eight. Our, our help desk number, and, and I believe that's in the actual uh, leaflet that Cindy sent out. And thank you again, Cindy, for sending that out. If you have any problems, uh, use that leaflet to contact us. Uh, there's a lot of different ways to contact us. Uh, next slide, please. All of this is on that, uh, that leaflet, so I won't go over all of it. I'll save my breath on that. Uh, but there's so much, there's frequently asked questions. There are veterans assistant briefs at the uh, lower website. 
uh, and it's no cost. And I, I want to give you a warning on this, on the no cost part for everybody online. If you're thinking about going into our process, there are folks out there that will, when you go to CVE, they'll say, oh, we can help you get through for this amount of dollars. If somebody's asking you for money to get through our process, it is not, I repeat, not a VA PTAC counselor or um, one of my uh, case analysts or the help desk. You can do this without spending any money, okay? Right now, there is no cost to doing our process. And I want to make sure that if anybody says, we can help you get through, that's up to you to go and, and, and uh, uh, have an agreement with them to, uh, to use them to help you get through the process. And they may help you. They may say, well, give them this. Or when they ask for that, let's change your documents this way. But it, it might behoove everybody to just try to go through the process without spending money. Because we all like low cost, right? Uh, low cost is good. Navy, Army, whoever, right? That's what I believe. So give us a chance to help you go through the process, <clears throat> excuse me, um, without spending money, right? So, okay, so the VABs are there. Those are the Veterans Assistance Briefs. For any one of the issues, let's say you want to um, ask about uh, uh, non-veteran control, there's a veteran assistance brief on non-veteran control on our website that explains it. There is one on uh, every, every one of those subcategories I talked with. So you can read all that. You can, you can go do a webinar. Uh, you can also uh, do verification education information tools that can help you kind of exp uh, look at some stuff to help you gather the right stuff. And the PTACs are excellent. I, I heard somebody talking about PTACs earlier. Use those folks. They're very knowledgeable. They've gone through our process. Um, and I think that's it for this slide. Don't forget the, the help desk number there. They can point you to a lot of good stuff. Next slide, please. Uh-oh, now we're to questions. I am nine minutes over time, uh, but I'll take any questions. Um, John, might I suggest this? Why don't we let... Director Daniel do his part, and then at the end we have time towards the end, and we can take all the all the general questions. Is that okay with you? Yeah, that'd be great. Actually, that'd be wonderful. Okay, great. So, so I'm going to stop sharing the screen. I'm not the most tech savvy guy. So, uh, Dwight Daniel is the director of of office of the office of small business programs at the defense logistics agency and uh, i'm going to let you take i'm handing you the mic right now dwight so you can take over sure so hey folks thanks and uh it, this has been a great discussion um you know I, i'll start by uh thanking all those that have served um it, it is uh, because of you we're able to have this dialogue um in an open candid discussion uh, where most countries wouldn't. So thank you for your service to our country and our nation. Um, I, I'll, I'll say that, you know, for, for all those that are, that are uh, business owners and, and veteran business owners, uh, in my assessment, you've done uh, the most two riskiest things a citizen can do. Uh, uh, the first thing you did was uh, sign your name on the dotted line and say, uh, I'm going to sign up and protect and defend this nation. And then once you got tired of that or, or, or uh, decided to say, hey, I want to go do something else, you then decided to do the second riskiest thing, which is I want to be a business owner. Uh, so uh, th this this conversation here is, is to me near and dear to my heart. Uh, as uh, mentioned, I'm Dwight Daniel, the director for the Defense Logistics Agency's Office of Small Business Programs. Uh, out of my office, uh, it is our role uh, to maximize small business opportunities uh, throughout the Defense Logistics Agency's contracting uh, portfolio, uh, which roughly spans over $40 billion every year. Uh, and so last year, uh, in fiscal year 2020, uh, we awarded roughly $42.3 billion, and all out of that amount, $15 billion went to small businesses. Uh, and DLA 
uh, as the nation's combat uh, logistics support agency, uh, we, we support the, the end to end global supply chain uh, for the services and other government agencies. Uh, and so uh, I tell people uh, we buy anything from commodities to consumables, uh, you know, so that it, it, our servicemen and women, regardless of where they are around the world, uh, they have the basic necessary things uh, at their disposal and at their use to, to go execute mission. And, and that is our sole job uh, is to make sure our warfighter is, is in the best position to ex execute mission at, at minute notice. Uh, what I wanna do here uh, is not really kind of uh, bore you to death uh, with a PowerPoint, but really have a kind of candid discussion on uh, what it takes to be uh, a successful business owner in the government uh, contracting space. And so I, I'll recap a few things that, that uh, was mentioned uh, in earlier comments and, and from my colleague from the VA, uh, but then I, I really wanna just have a, a targeted dialogue from what, uh, things that I'm seeing from my limbs. So I'll start with uh, the federal government's uh, mission to support small business. So uh, there was an act passed in the 1950s called the Small Business Act. The Small Business Act uh, essentially uh, stated that it is the federal government's job uh, and policy to maximize small business opportunities, and it designated uh, a goal of 23%. Uh, so 23% of the annual government's contracting spend uh, must go towards small businesses. Uh, and, and every executive branch agency uh, supports that, uh, whether it's the Department of Defense or uh, the Department of Veteran Affairs or any other uh, our branch of the executive uh, branch. And, and so uh, we do that through a variety of ways. Uh, my job in my office is one of several points uh, that, that you want to become familiar with if you're looking to get into the government contracting uh, space. Uh, we have uh, small business offices in every organization uh, of, of the executive branch uh, who have trained folks uh, ready to stand by and assist you on how to do uh, business with that agency and pursue business opportunities with that agency. Uh, for the Department of Defense, uh, we have a list of all of our offices on business.defense.gov. And, and I'll put that in the chat for, for future reference. And so if you are looking to get into that space, uh, I implore you to, to visit the websites of the various uh, agencies, especially in the Department of Defense, whether it be the Army, uh, Navy, Air Force, uh, or other defense agencies like, like my organization, DLA. Uh, we have a, a plethora of information out there, uh, free and accessible. And, and I, I, you'll hear a reoccurring thing uh, regarding free and accessible, uh, because everything that, that we do from a federal government perspective uh, to support small businesses is free and accessible to, to all those uh, business owners. Uh, now, they're, they're, it, you know, it was mentioned that there are folks that, that'll come and, and try to um, get persuade you to, to pay them money so that they can help you get certified. And, and that might be your choice, but uh, all of this stuff you can pursue for free uh, if you just kind of take some time to digest all the free information that's out there available to you. Um, one of the first things you have to do, and it was mentioned, uh, if you're trying to do business with the government, you need to register your organization in a system called Society for Award Management, SAM, SAM.gov. I put that link in the chat. It is free uh, to register and, and you need to be in that system in order to pursue any type of federal program, whether you're trying to get a government grant, uh, a government contract, or pursue government certifications uh, such as the CVE through the VA. Uh, the next thing you, you, you need to do uh, is really understand what you're offering from, from a, a, a company perspective. You know, I tell folks all the time, uh, really understand what your corporate capabilities are going to be uh, and what, what problem are you trying to help the government solve? Uh, is it landscaping? Is it construction? Uh, you know, all, all types of things are out there. Uh, but you really want to understand what you're offering first before you go start pursuing business certifications. A lot of companies I, I run across to uh, go pursue business uh, certifications right out the gate. And unfortunately, uh, it doesn't lend the will uh, it needed to right out the gate because of you haven't defined your corporate, cap corporate capabilities to take advantage of those certifications where agencies are are. are leveraging them. And so really lead with your, I, I tell companies, lead with your capabilities and not your certifications right out the gate. Uh, the, the next thing you want to do 
is really build your acumen up uh, around the business of government. And so out of my office, uh, we have the, the luxury and pleasure of running and managing the Procurement Technical Assistance Program, uh, which establishes a network of procurement technical assistance centers uh, across the nation. And so within your backyard, you have something called a PTAC uh, uh, that is there to assist you, uh, free counseling, uh, and, and, and help you shape your, your marketing plan to go after government business. Uh, I implore you to take advantage of these resources. Uh, we, they are very trained uh, professionals out there uh, who work with my, my entire team and through partnerships with the VA. Uh, you know, we, we, we work uh, through our program with a partnership with the VA uh, through the, for the CVE to help PTAC counselors walk companies through the CVE process uh, so that they're able to kind of guide and assist you along the way as you pursue uh, the VA CVE certification. Uh, and that, that's just one of several things that, that, that they're capable of doing. Um, and lastly, what, what I'll do a close out here before I, uh, uh, we can go into some Q&A, because I think that's really where I want to uh, spend a lot of my time is, uh, at the end of the day, folks, uh, you got to be able to help the government solve problems. You got to be able to deliver. Uh, I am in a no-fail missionary. Uh, if, if we don't deliver the things that, that our servicemen and women need, uh, it puts their lives at jeopardy. And that, that is something that we just can't accept. Uh, and so uh, if you sign up to do business with us, know that uh, every day we look to do our best and we're looking for companies to do their best, uh, deliver on what you say you're going to deliver on, execute how you said you're going to execute so that we in tandem can work together to support not only our servicemen and women, but this entire nation. And so uh, with that, I'll, I'll do a strategic pause there, turn it back over. Uh, to the moderator, but I'm very, very interested in, in uh, some of the questions out there in the atmosphere, because uh, I think that's where you can draw a lot of information from. So, so back over to the moderator. Okay, thank you very much, Dwight. Um, I'm gonna share a couple of questions that we had coming in. Um, first off, what are the biggest mistakes that small businesses tend to make when they approach Defense Logistics Agency and, and say, hey, I want to do business with you? What's, what's something that's going to sort of blow them out right away? Sure. So I, I, from, from my assessment, some of the biggest mistakes companies make, and this is not just uh, germane to the Defense Logistics Agency, this is uh, just really trying to do business with the government in general, is really not understanding uh, what the organizations buy. Uh, from, from uh, the opportunities that they have. So uh, a lot of companies uh, fail to do what I, what I consider some homework. Uh, a lot of information out there, folks, uh, a lot of free information. And yeah, it can be time consuming and, and, and money is time and I get that. Uh, but if you don't invest uh, in, in consuming the right information so that you're able to have a targeted dialogue to secure that business opportunity, uh, you're really just wasting your time and you're barking up the wrong tree where the apple just isn't going to fall from. Um, with COVID uh, happening right now, how do y'all do outreach? Is it is it uh, traditional events, or have you shifted to mainly online events? Sure. So that there has there has been a significant shift in the way the uh, the government in general uh, is, is engaging the business community. So uh, you know these type of events that we're doing right now. Uh, you know, typically if, if this would have been uh, early 2020 or uh, late to 2019, uh, we probably would all be in one big conference room, uh, eat, uh, sipping coffee, eating a bagel, uh, and, and having a candid dialogue. But uh, uh, we have all shifted to 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 all these WebEx and, and Zoom platforms uh, to strategically engage, and, and that is a huge uh, shift for us uh, from the federal government, especially from a small business outreach perspective. As uh, myself and my my colleagues, and, you know my. My peers that, that, that lead the small business program for the Navy, Air Force, and Army, uh, we have all invested in uh, uh, platforms to help us uh, still be connected to the business community. Uh, so we, we are outreaching through, uh, through the uh, teleconference means now. Um, and, and to be quite honest, I think that shift is kind of here to stay. Uh, as what we're seeing from our lens is that we're able to cast a wider net uh, to reach businesses coast to coast and globally, 
uh, that we normally wouldn't have if, if we were just flying all over the country uh, for one single event. Uh, you know, our, we're trying to be mindful of our, our travel dollars that are allocated and reinvest in ways that we can still uh, meet the mission by maximizing opportunities through outreach in a virtual manner. And so, yeah, we have shifted and, and that, that shift is probably here to stay. We hey, are right now. Have a question, one second. Go ahead. Go ahead, Cindy. I said, I think Alyssa had a question. She raised her hand. Uh, yes, because I was trying to type in the uh, chat. Dwight, how do we get in touch with you? Sure, so uh, I'll, I'll put my email in, in the chat here. Uh, but uh, the, the best way to get in contact with me uh, is go to dla.mil backslash small business. Uh, and on our webpage, uh, you, you have our, our direct point of contacts and, and my team will uh, loop you back. Uh, I, I will say I have no problem meeting with any company uh, I, I, from my lens. I don't care how high I climb up the, uh, the government ladder uh, in my operational lane. There is nothing uh, better than having a targeted business one on one counseling session with business owners, and I welcome that. I do those every Friday uh, from 9 a.m. to uh, roughly noon. And so uh, just shoot my team an email and we'll, we'll get you on my schedule. Awesome, thank you. Um, Dwight, would you mind repeating that link one more time, the DLA.mil? Uh, sure, sure, DLA.mil backslash small business. Backslash? Backslash small, small business. One word, okay. Yep. So I'm going to let you type that one yourself. <laughs> no <laughs> problem. <laughs> so, uh, Dwight, I have a question here. Um, teaming agreements and joint ventures. If a small business wants to compete with set asides with DLA, should they be the prime contractor and have a big business be their subcontractor? Or should they go into that as sort of a joint venture? Sure. So I, I think that the, the broader context would be uh, how do you leverage all the flexibilities out there uh, to secure business opportunities? And so uh, a lot of the ways that that uh, companies get into uh, their initial contract opportunity is through some type of subcontracting arrangement. Um, and, and so uh, I, I would say, you know, you want to employ and, and maximize all avenues to secure uh, revenue streams. So whether that be at the prime contracting level or teaming arrangements, subcontracting, or creating uh, a separate entity through a joint venture. Uh, I'll say that, that there are benefits uh, to all. Uh, there are cons to, to all as well. Uh, but, you know, really leave nothing on, uh, on the table here when it comes to uh, which way do I want to go and get a business opportunity, whether it's through uh, going after it on my own, uh, through a prime, uh, creating a teaming arrangement with another strategic partner. Uh, I heard uh, someone mention earlier around strategic uh, partner uh, with a potential competitor and how now they're working together. Hey, folks, let me tell you something. Uh, it's better to work together with those that are trying to maximize revenue streams in, in, in your footprint and space than it is to try to compete with them and you both miss out on the business opportunity. Learn how to partner and share and split the pie. Uh, that's how you create true revenue growth across the board. Uh, I, I, I find it very frustrating uh, from my lens when I uh, companies tend not to partner and they, they try to go and then they're coming back to me and, and they're, 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 they're spinning their wheels saying, man, I just can't get it. I just can't get it. Well, you know, where's your strategic alliance is that? You know, who, who are your strategic partners? Uh, leverage those relationships uh, to create more doors and revenue streams for your, your company. I think John Perkins had a question. His hand is raised. Oh, I didn't have a question. I had a follow-on comment. So when we're talking about joint ventures, just for everybody's understanding, um, joint ventures have to have, uh, if you're going after a CVE contract, I'm, I'm sorry, a VA contract, a joint venture has to be, you have to first get CV qualified as a, as a normal uh, certification, and then you have to get a joint venture certification on top of that to do business with the VA as a JV, just to just so everybody's understanding. That probably is different for the rest of the government, but for VA contracts, you have to be in our database as, a J, as yeah. both a, a base and a JV. Thank mm -hmm. you. No, you're, you're spot on. Uh, it's definitely a, 
works differently for the VA than it does for the rest of government. And, you know, it'll, it'll be that way, at least for the foreseeable future until the, they transition to one cert uh, over at the SBA. Um, Dwight, G, a typical path to do business with the DLA would be to have a GSA schedule, but if you don't have if you if you don't have that, or is there another way to do business with the DLA if you if you aren't at that PhD level to get a G, GSA schedule? Or is there an easier way? Sure. sure. So uh, uh, again, uh, in the broader context, um, I'll, I'll say that GSA is one of the many ways. Uh, that agencies like DLA and other organizations uh, buy common goods and services. Uh, and so, uh, I, you know, to companies who are looking to pursue GSA, uh, to them, I would say, who's your, who's your target? Uh, does, does DLA even leverage GSA for what you offer? Uh, those are the questions that you really need to answer before you go pursue that. Um, I'll tell you, DLA, like other organizations out of the U.S. Department of Defense and other agencies like the, the, like the VA, we do leverage uh, the GSA uh, federal supply schedule uh, to buy common goods and services. Yes, we do that. Uh, but depending upon what you offer, we may not use GSA schedule for that. And so it really boils down to, you know, understand what you're offering, how that agency buys it. And I'll tell you, uh, your, your local procurement technical assistance centers uh, are great resources to help uh, peel back the layers of that onion to help you uh, understand if, if the GSA contract is uh, a viable solution for me to pursue uh, to get government business opportunities. Mm -hmm. um, past performance and experience. If a small business is starting out and they don't have much experience themselves and they have a teaming partner, would DLA look at their at the experience as, as of the teaming partner, as of the team member, as would they accept that as experience or past performance? Sure, so uh, a great question. And I'll tell you, uh, th this is a uh, ever evolving topic around past performance and, and uh, how past performance is leveraged for uh, securing a, a potential government opportunity. Uh, so one of the latest things that, that uh, Congress uh, decided to do as it relates to uh, doing business with the government in this last uh, recent bill for the National Defense Reauthorization Act, which uh, for those that aren't in the, uh, what I consider the whole beltway uh, nomenclature culture, uh, it's the annual defense, fu <laughs> defense funding bill, right? So this is the bill that funds the operations for the Department of Defense. Well, uh, in this annual bill, uh, they also do a lot of what we consider contracting updates. And, and uh, in, these, in the uh, NDAA for this past year or this current operating year, uh, uh, Congress wants us to look at how we leverage past performance uh, strategically for companies who currently have not done business with the government or have done business with the government, but through a uh, subcontracting opportunity. And so uh, we're looking at ways to, to figure out how this is going to play out. Uh, from an acquisition uh, culture perspective and an award uh, perspective to make sure that the, there's uh, bias and both symmetry in, in all of this. But I'll tell you, uh, all past performance is good past performance, uh, but you have to make sure it's relatable uh, to the opportunity that you're trying to pursue. So uh, if, if you're going after a construction opportunity, but uh, you got all, all your past performance is in landscaping, um, uh, you are comparing apples to oranges, and that's not relatable uh, to the opportunity that you're that you're pursuing. So uh, I, I said all a lot to say uh, it's an ever evolving topic. Uh, more to come on that, and 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 know that agencies are not trying to penalize companies uh, who have not done uh, this particular type of work before. Uh, we're just trying to make sure that whatever you've done is relatable and reliable to the business opportunity that you're trying to pursue. I think Sheena from Sheena Parker had a question for Mr. John Perkins in reference to joint ventures. Is the certification process expedited, especially if there's a contract that companies are looking to pursue? I don't know if I asked that right. Sheena, you're welcome to unmute yourself and elaborate. I didn't know how to raise my hand, I'm sorry. But yes, um, if, if an agency, whether they're already SDVOSB certified or not, um, and they want to form a JV to pursue uh, a set aside. Is the process 
slightly expedited or should they just already have a JV company in place in case they want to pursue something in the future? So uh, speaking for VA contracts only, so I always have to distinguish that because I'll let Dwight answer for anything else, although I, I believe it's about the same, but, but slightly different because there's always different procedures. So let's say there's, there's a contract opportunity with a contracting officer on the acquisition side. That contracting officer sees maybe your company with the correct skill set, the correct NICS code. You can do the job. There's past performance, uh, but you you aren't you aren't certified either through your base certification and or JV. Um, the contracting officer can come to us, but it has to be the contracting officer. Not it cannot be the veteran owner or the veteran company or the JV as an entity, they can't come to us and say, we want to expedite this certification. There's all, the only process for, for expediting anything is for contracting office to say, I, I want to expedite this. So it has to come back to the contracting officer of the VA. That's the only thing that I can be responsive to in putting people ahead of the process. In other words, jumping in line. Other than that, you have to wait your turn and go through the process as you enter uh, and going through the case analyst and that entire process. Does that answer so, the question? So, John, that's like speak, like getting a champion within the system to help pull it on, pull it on through. Well, it's it's the it's the person that's that that is responsible for on the acquisition side of awarding the con not awarding but but the they're the ones that actually they have the license to award a contract they yeah. have the, they call it a warrant they can award the contract and they can come to me as a in my process and do what we call a um, priority processing on the VA side but other than that uh, the the there isn't really a, a expedited way, although I will tell you that people get them through pretty quickly if they have all the documents in and they turn the, the, their, their documents back over to the case analyst, you know, within a day or so, right? Mm -hmm. So the quicker you get what's required of you back to the processors, the faster it goes, I guess my point. Yeah, and then the only thing I'll add uh, regarding that in terms of uh, joint ventures uh, and approvals is uh, SBA uh, got real smart late last year to, to really consolidate uh, the joint venture programs uh, across uh, the SBA program. So uh, there was there was an 8A joint venture program, and then you had the all small uh, mentor protege joint venture program. And so now everything is under, under one umbrella, which uh, really will allow for more streamlined and efficiency uh, and hopefully uh, expedite time timeframes for approvals. Um, Dwight and John, if you ever see somebody who submits an offer and you just say, no way, I'm not going to take it. What, what something like that? What are the things that you would say? This, there is no way we're, we, we, we like, we like the idea that, but we can't approve these. They're too financially weak or they're not ready for prime time or what, what, what is it? So probably Dwight might answer that question better. Let's d distinguish between I'm the verification process. I'm not on the acquisition, <laughs> acquisition yeah. side. All I'm doing, all I, all my process does is verify folks that they have the, the ability to be a set aside on our list, on our VIP list in VA. I, I don't make nor, you know what? They always say, stay in your lane. That's not my swim lane. I'm a Navy guy. I stay within the two little lanes in the pool. So, what? so yeah, not a problem. I'll, I'll definitely take that. So uh, let me backtrack to say that this, this past year uh, and, and still do, dealing with the uh, COVID-19 response uh, has really shown us uh, ways that, that small companies uh, can be resilient in providing uh, the necessary tools, equipment, and things uh, needed to help the government respond to something most of us have not seen in our entire lifetime. And so uh, there has 
been stuff that that you know, man, no small business can provide that, and small businesses have been providing. Uh, you know, I'll say that uh, from from the Defense Logistics Agency perspective, uh, we have been working with. Uh, all of our federal government partners, both at the VA, uh, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, uh, to really uh, help uh, shore up domestic manufacturing for personal protective equipment, uh, whether that be masks, gloves, gowns, uh, things along those lines. And, and one of the challenges we, we've seen in the past year uh, is that a lot of this stuff isn't uh, produced domestically. And, and uh, when we're tasked with all the, the drivers uh, that are out there to to make sure that we're we're buying American-made products uh, for American contracts. Uh, it is it has been a challenge for us, uh, but I'll tell you, uh, small companies have delivered. Uh, the, these businesses uh, have submitted uh, the right specs, uh, delivered the right quantities uh, in support of these requirements. And so, uh, in my assessment, from my lane and what I've seen over the past year, uh, there's not been an opportunity that. A small business can't do. Uh, they just align themselves properly uh, and accordingly uh, to win that opportunity. Well, I think that we are getting close towards the end of uh, of our time frame, and we're we're not sure if uh, how long if, if anybody has any extra questions. Please um, submit the questions. If it's open dialogue, ask. Uh, I've got one question I'd like to ask of, of Dwight and John. If any of our small business panelists and, and speak help uh, of the members who are small businesses on this, would they, if they would like to ask, uh, send a question to you directly, would that be okay? Yeah, absolutely. That's fine. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. That's good. Yeah. Okay. If, uh, if there are no more questions or comments, Anybody? Okay. Okay. Thank you for the opportunity. No, I, uh, I have a couple of questions, but I don't think this is the uh, form to ask. So I'll reach out to uh, each individual uh, panel. Well, I, I would say that that you know to to, to whoever had the question, uh, there is no time like the present. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> you got you got the window of opportunity of two government officials. You need to take that opportunity. Yep. You got the question. Yep. Unmute, Ms. Clark. Unmute. Hi. Yes. Yeah. So, John, I have a question. Um, what are your thoughts on SBA now uh, replacing CVE as far as verification? <laughs> so, be above your pay grade. Uh, <laughs> bang, you hit it. Alisa, what you just said, doggone it, if I answer that question, I'll be going faster to Walmart and getting my vest on and greeting people than I am now. I mean, when I heard that, I was like, really? I mean, my I've been certified since 2010. I know I'm dating myself, and that's okay. But just then going through this um, 8A process and the months it took. I'm like, why? That just seems so out of their lane, but you know. Well, it's okay. So ownership and control is the same for all of them now, right? So like I talked about, your 8A process does have some distinctive differences and you can graduate from the 8A process and you don't graduate from, from being a, a service disabled set aside or veteran owned set aside so the ownership and control elements that I talked about, you should have been kind of familiar with some of those because you've done it. You, you probably put in your operating agreement or your bylaws and right. if, it passes, if it passes in one, probably passes in the other. But, but to, to, to your point, my comment on, on an NDAA, <laughs> whoa, if, if I commented on whether or not that was a wise move, yeah, I'd probably, if I went on the record saying, I think it's good or bad, woo. Doggy, yeah. Okay. Walmart's uh, picking up another greeter. All right, I got you. But yeah, I'm so doing I, recertification. I, I, so. I'll so. I'll give some context around that. Uh, and having uh, been more close to the fire in that conversation than what I wanted to over the past two years uh, in my right. position, 
Uh, I'll say that the, the intent behind all of this is to really have one belly button uh, in the federal government uh, in charge of business certifications. And because uh, SBA has the bulk of them uh, with uh, everything outside of uh, CVE, uh, it just made sense, uh, both from a congressional intent standpoint, but also from a federal uh, executive branch execution standpoint. Now, granted, that being said, uh, there's going to be hiccups regardless whether we continue with the, uh, the current model uh, of doing it or, or as we transition to the new model. Uh, but, you know, the intent was to really create one belly button uh, under uh, certify.sba.gov uh, to, to really allow businesses uh, one point of entry, one point of place uh, to go uh, ascertain and fill out uh, certification uh, applications. And that, and that really, uh, really was the intent behind it. Okay. Okay. Oh, Sheena? Hey. So I forgot to mention when I did my um, intro that I do have my SDBOSB woman owned and the corporate certifications, et cetera. Um, so I may have missed the mark on this. And I know with COVID, some things changed, but there was talk about the woman owned certification being uh, now being, uh, you had to pay for it. So I don't know if I misunderstood that when it came to the corporate certifications and I mixed the two. Um, but I also heard that maybe it had, um, they retrieved that or uh, retreated that because of COVID. Um, so it's, it's always free, 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 free. Or did I miss the mark on that? No. So the, uh, the woman owned small business certification, and this is, uh, similar to, to, uh, what we're trying to handle with, uh, the CVE certification as well as, uh, there, there was a different set of standards, uh, across government. So, and, and some, uh, aspects you could be self-certified as a woman-owned small business, and then and in certain aspects you needed to be uh, verified by uh, a third party as a woman-owned small business. And so, right now, uh, the woman-owned small business certification program uh, is free for certification uh, through through the SBA, and, and they're revamping the way that certification rolls out in terms of verification to make sure that a company who is uh, signing up to say they're woman-owned certified uh, meets the uh, check check boxes under the statutory program for what, what it means to be a woman-owned small business. And so uh, right now it is still free and uh, from my assessment will probably re remain free uh, and, and we will try to move away from that third party uh, sup uh, supporter uh, aspect of it as that was running into a lot of complications and we saw that. Um, let me just add just a couple of things because uh, it is correct. There is a process which makes it free, however, they are still using the third party certifier as a verification process that you can use. So it's almost fielder's choice. You can go get that uh, certification process through a third party certifier, or you can, or you can get it through theirs. Uh, and obviously, Sheena, I would think the, the next logical question for anybody would be, yeah. well, why would you ever not pay for, why would you ever pay for it? And the answer is, I mean, it's all about the, the money, right? Why, why would you ever pay for it? But the, the point is, I believe that, that some people feel that it's quicker through the third party certifier, but that's just a decision. Um, and uh, uh, that is, uh, like Dwight says, I, I don't know if they're gonna move away from it or not. Uh, I, I do know that they've got a lot of volume. And so you'd have to ask them which way is quicker if you wanted a quick answer because that because you did ask a quickness answer about how fast but to Dwight's point also remember they are trying to bring everything together and they've already done that in the ownership and control every single part of ownership and control of any verification process has the same standard uh, the SBA standard to include ours good questions by the way hey Sherman mm -hmm. hey uh, guys I have a question uh, and I'm, I'm thinking from a common sense business owner and dealing with the government. Okay, so scenario. Now, since I'm a product and I'm trying to sell it to the government and I know there's different agencies and you reach out to the small business uh, departments. When I talk about a sole source product it seems like it's harder to get people's attention 
when they're looking at a $12 million project and I'm just a small portion of it. I don't, I don't understand that. And if you guys could kind of explain that to me because I'm a solution-based product. You can, you can put new roofing on, new uh, AC and heating units in, new windows in, doors in. And when you pressurize that unit, the air releases, the pressure releases, and it has to release somewhere. And doors are used the most. <clears throat> and that's where a lot of your air infiltration is, even on your homes. If you get up and look at the doors, there's leaks in them. So how do I convey to the managers who actually put these contracts together? Because my opinion, once it gets to the contracting officer, it's pretty much done. So go ahead, guys. So I, I, I guess I'm trying to understand your question around, uh, you know, how, how do I uh, get a, a requirement that's pretty much sole source uh, to be accepted uh, by officials uh, where we, you know, where normally they're like, eh, we try to stay away. We like competition. So let, let me backtrack and say, as, as and I, I've been a contracting officer. I was a contracting officer prior to getting into uh, the small business officer lane. And so, uh, I'll, I'll, before you go ahead and start, but door seals are bought every day by the government, every single day. I, I, I agree. Go ahead. I, I agree. Uh, door seals are bought every day. And, and part of that is how are they buying uh, door seals? Are we, are we buying them sole source or are we competing them? Um, and, and that's up to each agency. But I, I'll tell you, uh, you, you need to first understand who, where you want to market uh, that product at and how they're buying it. If they are buying it sole source, uh, work through that local small business office say, hey, I know you guys are buying this. You're buying it on a sole source basis. Here's an alternative to it. Uh, and we could get it to you a little cheaper and, and go do a, try to get a product demo in with that particular office and they can put you in front of the right program manager uh, to determine if that fits the scope and needs uh, for what they're looking for. Uh, additionally, and I'm not sure if the product is, is registered or not, uh, but uh, if it's not registered, you definitely want to make sure uh, you register the product under the right NAICS code and the product service code uh, for what you're trying to do business in in the government. And then the last thing I'll tell you uh, from a product perspective is uh, the, the one of the things that, that may be a huge prohibitor is uh, the non-manufacturing rules. So uh, the non-manufacturing rule for products uh, really essentially states that uh, if a small business wants to compete on an only small business requirement uh, for a product uh, to deliver that product to the government, uh, the product itself has to be manufactured by another small business. And so uh, that though, that might be an inhibitor and a barrier uh, in itself as well. Okay, we had one of our attendees. So ask, what do you, oh, sorry. I'm sorry, go ahead. I, I said we had one of our attendees who also wanted to ask a question if we might let uh, Melissa chime in for just a second. I'm sorry. Sure, I sure. Finished. sure. Okay. Hi, so, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. Hi, my name is Melissa Tarver Pradanoff, and I'm one of the attendees. I'm here out of Atlanta, Georgia, and recently I've started into government contracting, been studying for about 18 months and have a pretty good gist of everything. So um, I'm still in the Army Reserves uh, 30 years next month, and I have, I found out I have a pending mobilization, but I've been getting my company up with certification and et cetera. Um, I got all the basic requirements except for the certifications. Now, from what I've been told uh, from another uh, VSOSB, as well as what I got from the slides from the PTAC, is that if you um, put in for your, in my case, SDVOSB, that will automatically pretty much I would get my WOSB because it's a similar process. And, you know, if you get that one, then you'll get your WOSB as well. Uh, I, I, I can answer that definitively because the guy that used to be my boss is now the deputy in charge of the WOSB. He's not in charge, but he, he moved over to the SBA. And he and I talk regularly. And the way they decided to work it, so they cut down on the work for WOSB, which is kind of cool, uh, is that if you pass CVE, you are a WOSB. 
because they, he knows our process. He used to be our director over here. So uh, what they did in, in their process, they said, if you go through either that third party certifier we talked about or CVE, you are WOSB by, by default. So yes, you are correct. Okay, thank you so much. Oh, my pleasure. That was an easy one. I like easy. <laughs> um, this is Bridget McCoy, and I, I had a question about having multiple businesses um, certified. Um, just in, in general, is it if, if the same officers in each <clears throat> of the organizations are applying for certification, is that something that is allowable through the um, through either of the, either um, agency? So let me, let me answer that from a regulatory standpoint. Um, if you've got multiple organizations and I've seen this over and over again, so let's say you're running two or three organizations, there is a part of the regulation that talks about that you have to be able to do it uh, during uh, normal working hours. And what, what comes up is you've got to prove that you're running one and running the other. And how can you be running one if you're running the other? And how are you then showing uh, uh, normal devotion during normal working hours. It's gotta be during normal working hours. So if you're eight to 12 on both, how are you showing that you're doing both? And you've got to prove that. Remember, it can be a rebuttable presumption. What I said was you can have a, um, a, a statement that shows you can do it, but it, but it becomes dicey the more and more companies you add. But now some people say, you know, that I, I'm working one that I'm building and then the other one might be after hours because I don't have any contracts and I'm just like perusing mm -hmm. USA jobs on the after hours. <laughs> Somebody's laughing, but I mean, that I've seen that and that that could fly, but it's, it's all based on what you put in and how you word it to CVE. Now, I can't speak for the rest of them, but remember, like I said, the ownership and control portions uh, and, and that goes into the control portions. All those standards are the same. So I would assume that you could do a rebuttable presumption for any of the different certifications. I'll stop and shut up at this point. Uh, Sheena's got a question on 8A, I believe. Yes, so with the SDVOSB, I understand that the reserve doesn't technically count as um, like federal employment, so you're able to still use that certification. When it comes to 8A, it's been back and forth whether you can be a W-2 employee of another company and also apply for your 8A. And it's, it's, I've gotten half and half as far as the answer um, outside of the reserve. So if I have a regular nine to five, can I apply for 8A? 8A, I can't answer for because that's SBA. And I'm, I'm sorry, but uh, yeah, you're, I'm a government official. And again, I'm in my swim lane with my flippers on going as fast as I can. And they're two little lines that, that you need to ask that to the SBA, but I'll tell you that. I did. <laughs> they what, didn't what, know. <laughs> Honestly, they didn't know. What was that? The, well, and it becomes almost, you can put in, you can put in for it and let them deny you. Uh, for us, there are times where we allow it. We look at each individual case and look at what your schedule is. We actually ask for, and that's part of what we ask for, or when do you work for this one? When do you work for that one? How do you control both? How do you control, and sometimes, uh, like I said, we'll have a, especially IT will say, yeah, I've got IT certification and I work for uh, Booz Allen in IT. And then in after hours, I'm searching USA jobs, but I have the managerial experience and the background to do this after hours. And I'm working, you know, they'll tell me I'm working or they'll tell our process, we're working after four o'clock to 10 o'clock and on weekends looking for jobs. Well, that, that may work for us. It may not work for 8A. And then I would, I would like to say to uh, all of our attendees and panelists, we will be having an event similar Pivot to Excellence for Women's History Month, and we'll have a representative from the SBA there. So Sheena, if you'd love to join us and ask that question in person, I'm certainly love it. <laughs> I got a question. So Dwight, this is, this is for you. Let's say you've got a um, woman-owned small business. They're certified by the SBA. And then they happen to go 
they have a good relationship with a, a large equipment supplier, like a, they sell generators or, or forklifts or something like that, that the DLA buys all the time. What's the approach that they should take to go to um, approach DLA? Is it to best, best to approach a, a, a buyer someplace and say, hey, can, I'd like to sell you this? Can you help me? What would be the approach? Sure. So, so the best approach uh, for DLA uh, through my office, uh, we do two two major things on a monthly basis. Uh, so we have uh, doing business with DLA one on one free webinars, which are hosted uh, by my team, uh, and they kind of go through uh, a very very detailed presentation on how to do business with DLA. So uh, for any company out there, uh, whether it's a woman owned small business or you know you go down the list. Uh, I implore those companies to, to visit our website uh, and check out our next session, which will be uh, next month because we just wrapped up this month's session. Uh, and we have a special focus. Uh, and this is, I don't think you let, under, knew you were leading with this, but uh, next month we have a special focus on women owned small businesses. So uh, if you are a woman owned small business and you're looking to do business with Defense Logistics Agency, I, I implore you to sign up for our monthly webinar. Uh, series to kind of get uh, get you smarter on how to go about doing business with us. In addition to that, uh, we have virtual matchmaking one-on-one -on -one appointments uh, with our various small business reps across uh, my agency. So I have about 50 plus individuals uh, under my uh, under my watch, and uh, companies can sign up for matchmaking appointments with those individuals uh, to kind of talk more candidly around what they provide and where it may fit within the DLA business opportunities. John, is there something like that with the, I know you have certification, but do you have something like that with the VA? Um, I, I just had to answer a quick email. Can you just kind of rephrase the question? I apologize. Um, if, if somebody wants to do business with the VA, is there, are there, are there uh, webinars or uh, online things where you matchmaking events where you can. Great question. It? Okay. I'm sorry. Uh, if you go to the flyer, you'll see where there are webinars and where to sign up for those on our website. And also uh, our OSDABU, does everybody know what an OSDABU term is? Off small and disadvantaged business utilization. Um, that's my parent organization. It's where my SES resides, my boss, right? Um, they, they have a, a sister organization called DAP, uh, Direct Access Program that the VA runs uh, and there are events like the National Veterans Small Business Engagement um, organ uh, process that, that the VA uh, has done in the past where we do exactly what you're talking about. DAP events is when we bring decision makers together with um, uh, SDVSB folks and as much as possible try to make a match. Although, it, I will be honest that the, the decision makers have to find that correct match in terms of skill set and prior past performance and all those things that have to go with it. But yes, we do have those events. If you go on the Osdabu website that I'm describing, you will see where those are. And there are also webinars available mm -hmm. for that kind of thing. Yep. Well, I think we're, we're getting close to the end of our time here and, and everybody's got to go go uh, do a lot of things, certify a lot of veterans and, and, and uh, research more small businesses and, and um, celebrate their birthday parties and things like that. <laughs> um, any final questions, comments? So Eric, if I may, and I, I put in the, in the chat here, uh, on behalf of my colleagues at the uh, US Small Business Administration, uh, next Thursday, they're hosting a special focus uh, web web webinar outreach series for African American business owners uh, in, in support of uh, uh, Black History Month. And so, uh, for all those that are interested in attending to learn more about uh, the resources available to uh, uh, business owners, but in particular African American business owners, uh, I implore you to sign up for that web webinar web, web series uh, next Thursday. I think it's the 25th, and I put it in the chat there, and it's free. Alyssa, did you have one more question? Yes. 
I uh, do. We have any more questions from the audience, the panel as a whole, or have we answered all those? I thought Bridget was about ready to ask another question, but then uh, I think the subject move on. Bridget, did you have another something else to ask? No, I'm. I've, I'll get. Um, I'll send out some messages. I have some. I'm fine. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. If there's no more questions, this has been so much fun. It's been just a pleasure, everybody sharing their life, you know, telling us about really openly and honestly, here's what I did, here's how I could do it, here's how I would recommend that you do it. I think it's great. Um, this was the kickoff event of, of our Pivot to Excellence series of summits and symposium, uh, symposia that Cindy, developed here for, for our chapter. And, and so I think it's just amazing. It was a great idea. This right here is, is the product of three months of work. Um, I'd like to give you a couple announcements of upcoming events. Cindy mentioned that on the 8th of March, we have our Women's History Month event. Uh, it will be a similar format to this. We have Women Entrepreneurs, at, uh, women entrepreneurs Executives and Leadership Summit. Uh, on the 24th of March, we have the Southeastern Army Medical Symposium, and we're, we have, uh, we have uh, Army Reserve Medical Command over in St. Petersburg speaking, and we also have General Bagby from uh, Dental Command, and we have, Army, we have the Army um, Medical Command uh, History Museum speaking and Army Medical Recruiting speaking. So that's gonna be really interesting. Uh, Dwight, if, some, if somebody from DLA wants to participate with medical type things, we, we'd love to have somebody speak on you know, medical procurement stuff. Um, on the 25th of April, we have a really cool event, uh, also a, on multi-continents. So right now we're broadcasting on, I think, four continents, Europe, Africa, Middle East, and United States, North America. Uh, but on the 25th of April, we have a military history event with Israeli American military history. We have a lot of Israeli generals who were involved in the Yom Kippur War. Actually, tank commanders are out there getting shot at uh, for a couple weeks in 1973, I believe that was. Um, May the 16th, we have part two of that, of the Yom Kippur War. That's also supported by AUSA Institute of Land Warfare. General Swan will be joining us to speak a bit. May, we have a FEMA symposium that we're planning. And June, we'll, we're still working out how to do this because of Central Command told us that it's probably not gonna be an in-person event, uh, but how do we celebrate the Army birthday? Who knows when the Army birthday is? It's a, same, same day every year. <laughs> we're, gonna, we're gonna party this time. Um, and then at the end of June, I think it's on the 18th, we have the Panama Caribbean Veterans Summit. So the Panama Caribbean Veterans Summit will have people who have, uh, will have veterans who have Caribbean heritage or Panamanian heritage speak and uh, tell their stories. That will include Panama, what's it include? Panama, Puerto Rico, uh, Cuba, your dad's from Cuba, my, my grandfather's from Jamaica and uh, my stepdad's from Cuba. Uh, we, have, we also have um, Dominican Republic, Haiti, US Virgin Islands, so it's gonna be a great event. Anyway, thank you for joining us. Um, if, if anybody wants to, to join AUSA, we're happy to have you join AUSA. I gotta put in the plug for membership. And, and if, any, if anybody wants to help us out do future events, We'd like to, we'll like to have you uh, on board. Thank you all. Great. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. Have a great day. Bye.